Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a special meeting of Brant County Council. Um, today, we have our, our attendance has been taken. We're all here. Councillor Bell is on the screen. He's the only one not in the chamber with us, but everyone else is here. The second thing on the agenda is um, the approval of the agenda, noting that it is a special meeting, so there can be nothing added or taken away from the agenda. And with that being said, I'd like to get a motion to put the agenda on the floor. Uh, Councillor Miller and Councillor Pierce, all those in favor, the agenda stands. Before we go any further, um, I, I want to let everyone know what today is all about. Uh, there's no decisions being made here today at all. Uh, everything that's going to be presented to you is an idea or something off someone's wish list or a proposal or um, it's a lot of things, but nothing has come to committee yet. Nothing has come to council yet. It's not something that's been pre-deceived. Pre we're, we're, we're just seeing this and hearing this at the same time you people are. So there's been no scheming or plotting by this council in any way. And um, I want to ask you to please not be growly and please be respectful of everything you're going to hear. There's obviously things you're going to hear here today that you're not a big fan of or you might, be, might not be in favor of. But right now, it's not about a, it's not about a decision and it's not about a discussion. Uh, the only questions that are going to be asked are by council for clarification only to the presenters. So at this point, um, people that are here today won't be able to speak. That's a different part of the process which is happening tomorrow and Wednesday. So please be respectful. I'm going to ask the presenters to be very mindful of the 10 minutes that we have. We have a lot of people on the agenda today, and we have other people that have just come in and they want to be added to the agenda. And Sarah, at the back here in the black, is taking your names and she's going to add you to our agenda so you're not forgotten. With that being said, we'll move on to number three, a pecuniary interest. I can't imagine that council has any pecuniary interest today. So we'll move on to number four, which is the public hearing. Um, so I will declare the public hearing open. Uh, I hereby declare that the public hearing under se section 1726 of the Planning Act for the County of Brant's new official plan be hereby open. The first thing on the agenda is 4.2, and that's the introduction of staff. Uh, Pam, you're going to introduce your staff. Thank you, Mayor Bailey. Um, my introduction is going to be very short and sweet, uh, but I did want to take a quick minute to say thank you. Um, I, I want to say thank you uh, specifically to Council for getting us to this point. Um, it has been three years, three long years, that the county has embarked on the new official plan, and we've seen a lot of change within that three-year time frame. We've been through a pandemic, uh, we have a different uh, council than when we started, uh, a new CAO, a clerk. So thank you to the past uh, councillors and Michael Bradley for their support, as well as all of our current leadership, Allison Newton and the clerk, for their continued leadership and dedication. Uh, we've seen 28 meetings of the public, and we've encountered great public participation through this process and feedback. We've seen many meetings and discussions with our neighboring First Nations, and we appreciate the opportunity to work cohesively with Six Nations and Mississauga to credit. We also want to thank uh, both internal and external staff for all their support on work on this project. Uh, we have muddled our way through and continue to do that with extensive provincial planning legislation and changes and processes. Uh, we have completed with Watson's an extensive MCR, an update to the MCR, LNA forecasts, and we've had many, many one-on-one -on -one discussions with uh, property owners, and developers, so thank you to all who have participated. Uh, but one thing that hasn't changed um, is the dedication of our uh, policy team in the County of Brant on this official plan project. And I specifically want to take a minute to thank uh, Jennifer Boyer, our manager of policy planning. Uh, Brandon and Jess, our policy planners. Um, Michelle, our senior environmental uh, policy planner. And even Lily Brown, our new student to the team. So thank you all very much. Um, and so they've been working very hard in the new social plan. I'm so uh, excited to bring it to uh, council and the public today. 
on uh, behalf of the County of Brant. And without any further ado, uh, Mayor Bailey, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen to start today's presentations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pam, and thank you, Mary, and members of council, and everyone for the public from being here tonight. Um, it's been a long process, as Pam said, and my presentation is very short, because as Pam said, we've, we've had 28 meetings over the past three and a half years. Uh, when we were compiling the list of, it's in your package, actually, of all the meetings we've had, not only the council meetings and special meetings, but then also our engagement activities. We actually were very taken aback. We had forgotten about some of them. Uh, we started the process in uh, November of 2019, and actually four months later we were hit with COVID. And uh, this whole process has actually been undertaken mostly during the COVID pandemic. And as you know, it's been challenging, uh, but we did this a lot virtually. Um, some of you, actually I met some of you in person for the very first time tonight, and it's unbelievable when you actually physically meet someone. And that's been happening actually over the last few months where I've actually seen people actually in person been able to shake their hand for the first time. Because it's all been on a screen for the last three years. So thank you very much for being patient with us because it's, it's been a, a challenge as well. Um, tonight, and just to reiterate what Mayor Bailey said, uh, today is actually just hearing about the public hearing portion of the Planning Act. It occurs under section 17 and 26 of the Planning Act which is an update to the Municipal Comprehensive Review and a new official plan. And then Section 17 is what we package up and get an adoption on our new OP and send it to the Minister of the Province of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for their uh, decision and approval. Um, so today, uh, we'll just do a quick presentation overview. And then I have uh, um, Jamie and Brad from Watson and Associates, they're the ones who, if you've got our dent or a package, it's a 600 page document called the Municipal Comprehensive Review, which is our land needs forecast and growth forecasting. So back in July 2021, we had actually a draft official plan, um, and that has been almost two years since we've been uh, since that point when we came to council. We also had another council meeting uh, on December 2nd and 9th of 2021. It seems like a lifetime ago, honestly. And that's actually the last real meeting besides some updates staff have taken to council on this. So you'll see an addendum, because a lot of stuff has changed over the past few years in terms of uptake of, of land needs and also um, an overview on that. So they're gonna come up afterwards to that overview. So just some key highlights, uh, again, about today is just hearing some delegations. What we've done is, as I know many of you in the audience, we've worked pretty tirelessly, like working through issues, uh, responding to inquiries, also submissions over the past few years. So what you see today are some either resubmissions, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and really, as Pam said, this has been quite, a, quite an unbelievable process over the last three years, just trying to get to this point. When I came to the county, I didn't realize uh, how much detail it would take to do an official plan, but it's, it's been quite a learning experience. And just to talk about our time frame, as I just sort of reiterated, is that just we've gone through quite the process throughout COVID. And I think if you think back, I don't know if you were involved in back in spring 2001, we had about four meetings um, in early 2001, and that was the height of the pandemic. We were locked down most of it at home. We couldn't even meet as a team in person as well. Um, and what we came back with in June 2021 was something called proposed policy directions. And in the new OP in section one, you'll see the fundamental assumptions, we call it, in terms of our land needs, of what protecting what we value, in terms of different things like how we green, you know, protection of agriculture, and then any lands that we needed to meet our forecast horizon. And then we came with that draft, as I said, in uh, summer of 2021. And as we know, as you see with your package, you actually have a, a sort of a final version of the official plan. Council's seen two official versions, but there's been actually about four in our office as we moved through the process and did all the comments. So, so we're here tonight. I don't think we'd get here tonight after all this time, but, um, and I'll talk about what we got from the province in a minute, but um, we're here already. And it seemed like on January 10th, when Council uh, told myself and staff to proceed, the time went pretty fast. Um, it was only four months to get this together, so we appreciate your uh, patience. And one of the things, as Pam mentioned over the past uh, few years, which is everyone knows has been extremely challenging for us, 
I've been working in planning for 25 years, um, and Pam's right behind me. We've never seen anything like that, I'm sure all the planning consultants as well. The last few years with all the provincial legislative changes has been just unbelievable and unprecedented. And actually the delay in our official plan has actually got us to uh, catch up. We had Bill 109 last spring, um, More Homes for Everyone Act it was called, and the province uh, changed sort of the way we did processing of applications. And then throughout the year, we heard that, uh, you know, there's an election. So I actually came to council last spring, if you remember, it was over a year ago. And I, we said, we haven't gotten comments back from the province. The writ is about to drop for the election. Council, what should we do? Should we pause or should we continue? As the conformity date for the legislation of a place to grow, or the growth plan as we call it, was coming up. And a lot of municipalities just proceeded as is. And that's one of the things I love about working for the County of Brant. Everyone has been incredible, especially the administration, the staff, and council to offer the flexibility to do that. When you're in a larger municipality, sometimes you have contracts, you know, especially with our consultant, and you, you can't offer that kind of flexibility. So the fact that we've been nimble through this process has actually served us well. So if you remember in the fall, we came to you, Bill 23 came in, which is more homes from everyone. And this was also an unbelievable precedent, uh, provincial policy change, changes to the Planning Act. And this has caused some disruption in terms of the planning world. Again, our delay has served us very well in this regard in terms of our OP. And as you can see, um, one of the issues that we were waiting for is after the sort of July 2021 meeting is we sent a draft to the province, and that's called the 90 day one window review. So what they do is MMH London gets all the agencies in the province to look at our OP, and that's usually is a 90 day time frame. So that's actually what they have, just like us when we review applications, they're supposed to stick to their time frame. Um, they did actually go through some commenting process. We meet with the province actually almost monthly, sometimes bi-monthly on updates. Uh, we're actually gonna have a meeting with them in the next week about our submission. Um, those comments due to um, actually so, so you, probably about some politics and also in terms of the housing affordability strategy and task force report that was coming is they press pause themselves internally. So we actually didn't get a letter from the province until December 29th, um, just last year, 2022, where they said, we aren't going to offer formal comments, but we do direct you to proceed with your official plan. Just note there's some policy changes coming through. We're going to work with you through them, but we actually want you to proceed. Um, and that's what we've done. So, and just to reiterate um, some of the process, so in December 2021, staff came back with a very large report to council, and we heard um, 24 delegations, and it was all done virtually on sort of site-specific reviews. And that's usually when someone comes in with actually a package, um, and they look at, you know, what we could do to add them to, it's like a pick-me request, as we call it, either a boundary expansion or a designation change, or they have questions about the process. One of the things, though, that's happening, especially with some delegations tonight, is they have Planning Act applications already in process right now. There's also Ontario Land Tribunal um, items also attached to this agenda in review. Um, and also, there's just new ones uh, that are offering up to consideration. But in terms of the review itself, um, our Jessica Kitchen has actually done this unbelievable spreadsheet that's attached to your agenda. Council saw that in December. What we've done for this specific process is updated it as we work with people, um, especially with three submissions. And you'll see attached to the agenda anyone who's worked with us through the process, and especially those who have resubmitted something for consideration. Because in December, if it wasn't recommended, what they've done is take a step back, think about it, and then come in again and say, okay, well, what about this amended proposal? Does this have merit? So that's why you see these packages in front of you. And uh, some of them have been reviewed and we have worked with some of the landowners. And so that's what's for council's consideration. And just so, you, as Mayor Bailey said as well, this is, this is not an end game, especially with applications that are in process. It's just that this process, especially due to the time, we have something called a transition period. And that's what we'll talk a little bit more probably tomorrow, is how it is, 
how it affects the application, and that's why there's some recommendations in the report to actually acknowledge that. So when the council adopts the official plan, it's not approved by the minister, it's adopted, and then it said, yep, it's done, we're going to send it to the province for their actual approval and decision. The minister can then decide to make any modifications to that, and that includes site-specific submissions, any objections, they go through the whole process, and then they will offer us a decision, and that's usually, unfortunately, taking up to a year at this point um, from the provincial level, so. And I just wanted to talk about our building relationships. As Pam mentioned, we've uh, built a lot of relationship with neighboring indigenous communities, especially Six Nations of the Grand River and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, the official plan process has actually really revamped this relationship building. We know a lot of the um, members of the communities very personally. Um, actually, and we're a signatory of the Grand River Notification Agreement with Six Nations and Mississaugas. We actually have a meeting on Thursday about it. It's our biannual uh, meeting coming up. We also have a big meeting where 10 staff are going down to Six Nations actually in a few weeks. It's all part of that relationship building. And if you read the plan, and I do suggest you do in terms of, of the section in it, we're one of the only municipalities to actually offer that type of relationship as noted in our official plan. So it's been a, a very great uh, learning experience to build those relationships. And just as you know, a lot of people have asked us, what are the changes from the July 2021 version of the OP to now? Um, I've met with most of you and explained that there's obviously the addendum to the Municipal Comprehensive Review, which uh, Jamie Cook will explain. Um, the growth management strategy really just got tweaked for clarity. Um, the fundamental assumptions are still the same, um, except for the employment land needs, which Jamie will explain. Uh, I talked about Indigenous enga engagement and reconciliation and the strengthening of those policies, um, and also clarifying the community structure, and that's really like how we classify settlement areas. Are you either in a primary system or are you a rural? And the province really differentiates between the two. And in terms of our primary settlements versus are you a rural settlement and the rules that you have to follow for those things. And that followed with some land use designation changes for clarity, policy tweaks, and what's our toolbox for implementation? Because that's really the key thing. We have a plan with a bunch of words, but how do we actually implement it? And then when we transfer this plan to development planning, when they get an application, how does that work? So I just talked about the MCR, and I'll let Jamie and Brad talk about that in a minute, but I'll just want to let you know that a lot of people have asked us with these changes in provincial legislation, has our forecasted changed? Like, has there been any change? Because we heard all this thing about this more homes and, you know, these targets, also the hit list, they call it, of the municipalities. The County of Brant is not on that list. It's a 29 municipality sort of big cities list. We are not on that list. And there's a transition uh, policy in the new proposed provincial planning statement that says you are to use your existing forecast if you are not on the list. And that's what we're doing, and we've had confirmation for the province is that's what we are going to do. So thankfully, we didn't have to change anything in our land needs assessment, which was very good. So we're good, and we had that information before, and we're keeping it. So. And I talked already about the community structure in terms of our actual mapping. Um, just one of the clarifications that I want to talk about in terms of our primary settlements. There's been obviously some, um, a lot of talk about Burford and also, you know, the colors on the map and what they mean. Um, these are our primary, set primary settlements and they are today and they will remain so. In fact, the colors on the map, as we call it, haven't changed at all. It's actually the same as they were before. So I guess the classification of what was now and what will become, we haven't made any changes at all. Um, it's more or less just strengthening the policies about, you know, in terms of uh, servicing and allocation and, and future things about what will happen in the future. I'm gonna talk to a community structure. And some of the other policy changes that we've strengthened and did a lot of edits on in, in the last few, um, couple years in terms of comments, and we actually thank a lot of the comments that have come in, especially in the last version of this draft, really to clarify a lot of the comments. Like, the comments have actually been excellent, 
Um, so we really appreciate that from people. So these are just some of the um, defining elements of our complete communities, as we call it. And I talked about just the toolbox, uh, some of the implementation tools. Just with Bill 23, the last one of the things we have to do right after the official plan is the zoning. So Bill 23 actually changed it from three years to one year. So as soon as we have an official plan approved, we have to do the zoning immediately, which is a good thing. So I've seen it linger in municipalities for up to five years, and it causes a lot of uh, issues with the official plan and zoning. Um, so that's one of the things we'll be doing right away. Um, we'll be also doing some design guidelines, um, talking about heritage, conservation districts. We also have to do our archaeological management plans. So there's, there's no shortage of work as soon as this is done as well. So that's a wrap up for me. I'm probably going to turn it over to Jamie now. But really, the key recommendations is, like I said, this is really the end point of our new official plan after three and a half years. Um, these are things that will not be discussed today, but this is uh, for tomorrow's work um, in terms of del deliberation, what's in the report recommendations as you see. And like I said, the process doesn't end here. We have a, a very large package that will go to the province in about two weeks. Uh, we have to post a notice of adoption, and there's a huge checklist we have to send. It's probably going to be over 4,000 pages we'll be sending to the province, so happy reading to them, as we say. Um, and it triggers off their process. They actually do the same thing as we do when we get our application in. They deem an application complete. We have a checklist, just like we do with, uh, with developers. Um, so it goes off into their process. They have technically 120 days, but due to Bill 23, the minister can exempt themselves from that time frame. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens after that. So um, then with further ado, I will uh, bring up Jamie Cook from Watson Association for the next presentation. Mr. Mayor, can we, can we ask one question? Oh, yes. Councillor Miller. Just before we get deep in it, um, I have another question I'll leave until tomorrow. Um, but just one question, and that is, um, in light of the new PPS coming this fall, and we expect some significant changes, two questions. Because, <laughs> and it was mentioned in a couple of the submissions, and, and I was thinking the same thing. Why do, why do you think this is a good time to bring the plan forward today, now, in light of that? And second question, do we expect many changes given what you kind of know about the new PPS coming? Yeah, through the mayor to Councillor Miller. It's a great question. We've had that asked and also included that answer in many comments. So uh, we've been directed to proceed by MMH London. They reiterated that message last month. Uh, we've actually... If, there was a few days delay, I would say, getting the draft final version out around Easter. We spent Easter weekend looking at the new PPS. Um, we've made some tweaks. So what the ministry said is look at it, anticipate some changes, um, see what you could do. Um, but in essence, they said, no, you are to adopt your plan on the date. That is um, the policy of if that's in effect. You've already done a good job. And to be honest, when we were looking at the proposed new provincial planning statement, we didn't actually have to make very many changes. So the only outstanding uh, item is obviously the agricultural lot severances. Um, that's to be determined. I know there's a lot of pushback going on in the province. Um, but whatever is decided, and I think what's going to happen is we're going to submit, the summer's going to roll by, that, let, that policy change is going to come through probably around by October. They're going to make modifications to our plan. Um, but honestly, we've gone through it, and there's not a lot that we probably anticipate there's going to change. So, But we've been directed to proceed, so thanks, Councilor Miller. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. I just I wanted to get that out of the way. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, and um, thank you very much for having me here today, uh, Mayor Bailey, members of council, uh, members of the public, and also staff. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here in person to be able to present to you the final results of the county's municipal comprehensive review and land needs assessment. As, as Jen mentioned, this has been a long road, and as well as Pam, and really pleased to be here today to be able to present you the, the final results of our analysis. 
So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm just going to walk you through some of the key highlights of the addendum report and um, address any questions as, as, we, uh, as we go or following the presentation. So just to uh, start off, the purpose of the addendum is really to provide an update to the July 2021 MCR report. As Jen and Pam mentioned, that report was prepared quite some time ago in 2021. Uh, we didn't receive any comments specifically from the province, but given the time that had passed since the report was prepared and given the ongoing changes that we've seen uh, with respect to legislative changes at the province that we could incorporate into the document, uh, there was a need to update the report. We felt because of the size of the report, it was better to really focus on a more um, prescriptive and, and focused addendum report rather than updating the, the, the uh, original document, which was, which was obviously very large in size. So we really wanted to scope the specific changes I would note that in the appendices, uh, we have prepared an update of the entire appendix material, so you've got an updated set of numbers with respect to the uh, final outcome of the, the land use assessment. We also wanted to uh, incorporate any comments from stakeholders as well as staff comments in the, uh, the final agenda report. I also want to mention that we were preparing this report in the winter of 2023, so we haven't, and, and the early spring, so we haven't incorporated specifically the impacts of Bill 97 or the proposed PPS, but as Jen mentioned, we really were able to anticipate those trends fairly closely, and uh, we really, I think, nailed it quite well in terms of ultimately where we felt the proposed PPS and uh, Bill 97 were going, and ultimately where the county needs to go with respect to the MCR report. So as Jen pointed out, I don't see any real significant changes that would be required to this document to incorporate uh, the the PPS, uh, proposed PPS or Bill 97, with respect specifically to the land use assessment that you see before you here. So there's three key aspects of the MCR update, the addendum report that I wanted to lay out today. First is the long-term growth analysis. So we went back and we took a look at recent trends that we've experienced with respect to population, housing and employment growth. And we reviewed those trends and we updated the forecast accordingly. And I'll get into the details as we go further today. We also took a look at the long-term community uh, area land needs assessment and took a, a further review of what those needs were over the long-term period. We also reviewed Burford and based on feedback we received from the province through our discussions, we did determine that Burford should be uh, an area that remained in the urban system and included in the land needs assessment. So we have brought Burford back into our urban land needs system, our urban system, and we have identified the land needs for Burford over the long term. We also took a look at the excess lands policy that's identified in the growth plan, and our interpretation of that policy was uh, reviewed further. Given the removal of the growth plan through the proposed uh, PPS in uh, Bill 97, ultimately we felt that, and based on feedback we received on the excess lands policy, we felt that that policy really was rather uh, uh, constraining to ultimately to growth in, uh, in the county. And given that that uh, policy will be ultimately removed, uh, in the new legislation, we felt that it was appropriate to remove that. And I'll speak to that in a little more detail as we walk through the slide today. And then lastly, we did uh, do a further review uh, with respect to the long-term urban land requirements. We have, we have also an employment strategy that we're preparing that will provide more feedback and, and, and details that, that are foundational to the MC, MCR document. Uh, but one of the key things that we uh, ultimately concluded was that there was a need to as, uh, address and recognize stronger demand potential for urban employment development, particularly in the Brant 403 Business Park. So just starting with our review of the growth trends over the last uh, few years, uh, one of the things we, we looked at was we took a, uh, uh, a check back to the 2021 census data, which wasn't available at the time that the 2021 report was released. And we did notice that we're actually tracking a little bit higher. There's been, and that's no surprise with all the development that we've been seeing uh, since around 2019. And then that acceleration that we've been, we experienced during the COVID um, uh, pandemic. We have, we did note that the population is tracking higher, about 1,300 uh, people higher and about 245 units higher. Uh, a large portion of that uh, additional growth has been identified in Paris. So it's largely a Paris issue where we're seeing the additional growth. It's about a thousand, we're tracking about a thousand higher in Paris and about 200 units higher in Paris as of 2021. Now it's also important to mention that the census doesn't actually accommodate active development um, 
uh, applications or building permits that were being processed and approved during that 2021 period. There's a lag time to build between building permits being issued and occupied. And then there's subsequently been significant growth uh, in 2022 as well. Um, and I'll speak to that in a bit more detail. So we've looked at those trends and reflected that in the near-term forecast, and I'll speak to that. I also wanted to mention that there was a boundary adjustment in 2017 as a result of the annex some annexation uh, of lands that occurred in, in Brant in the rural area uh, to Brantford. That was about, um, uh, I believe, 1,100 uh, uh, people or so. So uh, the population actually was reduced slightly in Brant uh, from the base in 2016. So it actually looks like we're even closer than perhaps we were, but I just did want to mention that when you see the numbers as we move forward. So this slide provides a summary of active building permit activity for new units over the last 20 years, and it's broken down annually and by structure type, sorry, not by structure type, by, uh, by geographic area, so by Paris, St. George, uh, and the rest of the county. And so over the long-term period, we've seen an average of about 240 units being um, approved or processed within uh, the County of Brant over that period. And this is for new units only. And this does give us some indication of anticipated and, and historical demand. And when you look at the, the last five years, you can see that surge of development activity that has occurred since 2018. We saw the average of 240 a year increase on average over that last four year period to about 450 units a year. So a significant increase. Uh, that increase was occurring prior to COVID. COVID essentially uh, had an accelerating uh, impact on that growth, as you can see in 2020, and it did start to moderate slightly in 2020, uh, 2021 and 22, but it has remained high. When we look at the 23, 2023 building permit activity coming in to date, we have noted that the permit activity has moderated quite, uh, quite, quite substantially. We're looking at about an average annualized rate, based on where we're at today, of about 150 units for uh, Brant County in the 2023 period. So we don't fully know yet where we'll end up in 2023, but we do see a slowdown, and that slowdown really is a result of the, the current um, economic environment that we're in and the real estate uh, impacts, uh, impacts that's had on, on real estate, largely as a result of the uh, increases in interest rates that we started to experience um, back last year, starting in about March. So just to look at that a little bit further in terms of the real estate market, what this graph shows is it shows the overall amount of sales to listings. And this is a common, uh, a, quant a common metric that realtors and, and real estate professionals use to look at the overall strength of the market. So typically when we have a sales to listing ratio above 0.6, that is typically indicative of a seller's market. When we're between 0.4 and 0.6, that's typically indicative of a balanced market. And then when, when we're below 0.4, that's typically indicative of a buyer's market. And you can see during the COVID period, we really saw the sales to, list, uh, sales to listings ratio spike quite significantly to well over 0.6. We were in a very strong seller's market during that time period, reflective of also the significant growth potential we were seeing. But since that increasing of the interest rates uh, in early 2022, we have noticed a very uh, significant decline in the overall sales to new listings ratio. And at this point, in early January, we're now entering into a buyer's market. So we have entered a, a definitely a more balanced market, and we've seen a cooling in the, the uh, recent housing activity. Our long-term outlook is that growth will, will continue to be strong, and that the trajectory for growth is still much higher over the forecast period than it was uh, when we look at the long-term average. But we do feel that we've peaked relative to the, uh, the rates of growth that we saw during the, the pandemic in 2021 and 22. So this slide provides a bit more detail on the permanent activity by structure type. So we're looking at density essentially when we talk about structure type. So this looks at low density housing in the dark blue, which is typically single and semi-detached housing. Medium density housing is typically townhomes. And high density housing is typically apartments, either rental or condo apartments. And you can see over the last uh, 20 years uh, or so, we've seen a fairly uh, significant shift towards more medium density housing. We've seen that shift from about 6% of the permit activity over the 2003 to 7 period to about 31% in the 2018 to 22 period. And this is really a reflection of affordability. Ultimately, new families and uh, uh, demographic groups, particularly in those age uh, or those family forming age groups, are looking for 
affordable, competitive price, competitively priced housing opportunities to ultimately um, uh, plan for families in the in the long term, or, or sorry, I should say the near term and longer term. And essentially, given the uh, affordability challenges that we've experienced across the uh, G GTA and, and in the outer ring, townhomes are really starting to reflect a, an alternative to uh, a low density product that ultimately maybe would have accommodated these individuals in the past. Uh, and now we're seeing more uh, more demand for for uh, townhome development. Ultimately, we do expect to see this uh, this, this uh, trend continue over the forecast period to see a greater share of medium uh, density housing. We also expect to see a greater shift of more high density housing. So we haven't seen a significant shift to date, but when we look at the permit activity uh, and we look at the uh, uh, development activity and the approvals process, as well as when we consider the demographic trends that are uh, influencing the county with respect to an aging population, we would expect to see this shift uh, steadily increase over the long term. So this slide presents the long-term outlook for the County of Grant 2051. This is the same slide that Jen had presented in her presentation. And a few key, uh, key highlights that I want to present here is that ultimately you can see that we are tracking quite close in 2021 with respect to our anticipated number versus the census update. We're only about 200 off. We do, and a part of that is about as a result of that boundary adjustment that I mentioned. When we look at the permit activity, we do anticipate that we will be slightly stronger in 2026, but not significantly stronger. We anticipate that we'll be tracking very close to our 2026 estimates in the 2021 uh, MCR document. Then over the long term, we do anticipate that we will come close, more closely aligned back to the uh, results of the 2021 MCR. And then ultimately, by 2051, we're still anticipating the same population of 59,000 uh, at that um, 50, 51 period. I would uh, emphasize that this forecast is still a minimum target uh, set out in the, the growth plan and ultimately the implementing documents. So there is potential for more development to occur, providing that there's services to accommodate that growth, and there's obviously a market to deliver. Similarly, with the housing forecast, you can see we came in a little bit lower, um, or the census came in a little bit lower than our forecast. That really was a largely result of that boundary adjustment that I mentioned. With the building permit activity that we're seeing, we're slightly higher in 2026, and ultimately by 2051, we're unchanged with about 22,000 units uh, projected, or, or total households, uh, by the 2051 period. So this slide here presents a summary of the total net migration and natural increase that's required to accommodate the forecast. And the reason why I'm bringing this uh, slide up is to show that even with the forecast at 59,000, which some may consider to be somewhat uh, modest given the amount of growth pressure that we've experienced in Brant uh, in recent years, there's a significant amount of net migration that's required to achieve that 59,000 total population by 2051. And the reason why there's so much net migration required is because the population is aging within Brant County. That's putting downward pressure on growth from natural increase. So there's more deaths occurring per year than births. And ultimately, we're more dependent on net migration as a source of population growth to maintain that same level of growth that we've received in the past. Ultimately, to achieve the rate of 59,000 people, we require about 3,100 new migrants within Grant County every five years uh, to accommodate that, that forecast. This is, uh, it's primarily uh, net migration through intra-provincial migration, so migration from other parts of the province, uh, most notably the GTA. So it's really primarily a, an outward growth pressure issue, but there's also more immigration coming to the County of Brent as well, which is also helping to drive that number higher. But when you look at the overall ratio uh, between the forecast uh, rate of migration versus the historical trends, this is about a 55% increase in the amount of net migration. So it's a significant amount of growth to, to accommodate just to achieve that minimum forecast. So this slide provides a bit of a further review of the growth forecast, not only by five-year increments, but also um, uh, looking by uh, structure type. And so uh, and this is uh, really focusing on Paris. And the reason why we're focusing on Paris is because most of the pressure that we've seen for growth in Brant County has really been in the Paris area. As I mentioned, about 88% of those permits that we looked at over the last five years have been in Paris. So we've taken a look at that and we've noted those uh, 
uh, those growth pressures. And we've increased the overall forecast in Paris, and that's ultimately had an impact on the growth forecast over the next five years and ultimately over the longer term period for the County of Grant. So we have identified higher growth in the next, uh, in the next few years um, following uh, to 2026, but we have ultimately moderated that growth slightly over the long term, particularly in the, in the post 2020, uh, sorry, 41 period. So with respect to the amount of growth between urban and rural, we have identified a mix of about 80% of the growth being in the urban area, which is comprised of Paris, St. George, and Burford, and then 20% of growth in the rural area. And ultimately, when we look at that rate of growth overall, uh, 256 units a year, this is about a 50% increase in the overall amount of housing that, we've, uh, that we're anticipating relative to growth over the last 20 years. So it's a significant amount of growth that we've identified uh, for both the uh, urban and rural area, again, based on those uh, Schedule 3 forecasts and looking at the trends that we've uh, been experiencing, we feel this is an appropriate uh, allocation. We also have prepared a more detailed allocation of all of the growth in the rural area by uh, uh, rural settlement area and remaining rural area. Uh, about, I think, two-thirds of the growth in the rural area is occurring in Mount Pleasant, Scotland, and Oakland. Uh, and then the other uh, rural areas uh, make up the, the remaining amount of growth. And there is details to provide you if you are looking for, uh, for that. So moving on to the community area land needs. This first slide provides a summary of the overall demand for housing and supply within Paris. And what you can see here is that the demand for housing over that 30 year period is anticipated at about 4,200 units. And when we compare that demand to supply at around 6,900 units, we have an overall surplus of, of housing to 2051 of about 2,700 units. So what this means is that there's more supply in Paris right now than there is demand to accommodate our forecast to 2051 under that minimum growth scenario. And I would note that of the 6,900 units, about 53% of those units in the supply are in draft uh, approved and registered unbuilt units. So there are a lot of developments that are um, currently in that approved st uh, stage. There's also other um, units that are not in that approved stage that would require approval and ultimately would require servicing capacity, oops, sorry, to accommodate that, that growth. When we look at St. George, we have a similar situation. It's even uh, more, um, there's even a, a, a further uh, surplus that we see here when we compare the demand to the supply. Overall in St. George, we've identified a demand of about 1,600 units over the next 30 years. Compared to the supply of 5,600 units, that's a surplus of about 4,000 units in St. George. And again, uh, when we look at the supply, about 61% of that supply in, uh, in St. George is in draft approved units. Uh, ultimately, there's other, the other 39% of those uh, units in the supply are not, do not have approval and would require um, ult ultimately uh, uh, planning approval and uh, servicing capacity to accommodate that growth. So when we compare the overall amount of units of demand to supply and then when we look at the overall density of that demand relative to ultimately um, the amount of demand that we're expecting, we can then look at how much land does that generate in terms of a surplus. So in Paris, we've identified a, a surplus of 231 hectares. There's no change relative to the surplus that we identified from the 2021 report. It's still the same surplus. In St. George, we've identified a 164 hectare surplus, which is also the same surplus that we identified in the 2021 document. The difference here is that we've added Burford into the urban system. So we've reviewed Burford's lands, and we've compared those, the supply of Burford lands to the demand and that is generating a large surplus of 347 hectares of land in Burford. Uh, now, there is significant servicing challenges in Burford. We have acknowledged that in the report, but with respect to the amount of land that's designated and in the actual urban settlement area, this is ultimately the result that we, that we get. Ultimately, that generates a 742 hectare surplus of lands in the designated areas within Paris, St. George, and Burford, to 2051. So what this means is again, based on our minimum forecast of 59,000 people, there is more than enough supply to accommodate that growth over the long-term period. 
We also took a look at the uh, ultimate build-out potential within both Paris and St. George. We know that there's lands in uh, Paris, and we know that there's lands in St. George that ultimately could uh, provide opportunity for future growth that would go beyond the 59,000 population if those lands were approved for development and ultimately if servicing capacity was uh, identified to accommodate that growth. And so when we look at Paris, the ultimate population of Paris uh, that we've identified at build-out, including some intensification potential, would be around 32,000 people at build-out. With, with uh, respect to St. George, it's about uh, 17,000 ultimate build-out. So when we look at the rate of build, or the amount of growth uh, related to build out, uh, related to what, or compared to what we have today, that's about an almost two-fold uh, increase in Paris, in terms of the size of Paris, in terms of population, and about a five-time increase for St. George. Ultimately, there's the potential to add, and there's a lot of numbers here, and I appreciate it, it's a bit confusing, but there's the potential to add about six, almost 16,000 additional people in Paris and St. And St. George through uh, lands that are designated in greenfield areas and also potential intensification. But those lands ultimately need to be, re they need to be reviewed in terms of their potential and ultimately their servicing uh, uh, allocation. Uh, and there needs to ultimately be a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of what that um, capacity is and, and the timing of that capacity. Ultimately, this build-out, in my opinion, is a post-51 period. There could be some potential to see some of this additional growth occur in Paris and St. George prior to 2051, providing that the infrastructure is identified and it's in, pl in place. But ultimately, in my opinion, this build-out is largely a, a post-2051 issue. So I spoke a little bit on the excess lands policy. Just again to recap, we have removed this policy. Essentially, what we did is we looked at those surplus lands that I just went through and we identified those lands through the growth plan policy to be excess. So they were identified specifically in a schedule in the official plan. Now that that policy is being removed from the growth plan, we've determined that that policy uh, should be removed as well through this uh, uh, final MCR and Lanny's assessment and ultimately in the official plan review document or official plan documents. We also felt, based on feedback we received from stakeholders, that this forecast—sorry, this policy—is relatively constrictive. Uh, it potentially constrains lands ultimately uh, to develop um, beyond the, 2000, the, uh, the 2051 number, and we don't want to necessarily constrain development unduly. We do note that the forecast is a minimum, so it's very difficult to say. On one hand, the forecast is a minimum, but yet we've identified all these lands to be excess and they're identified to be essentially frozen over a time period. So we always felt that this policy was somewhat contradictory. We never really received a very, um, a, uh, we didn't receive a formal or even uh, a verbal response from the province of how to interpret this policy. Now that it's being removed, we're proposing to remove it from the official plan. As I mentioned, we've added Burford to the urban settlement area. This was really reflective of comments we received from the province that Burford is a settlement area. It has a, at the time, um, and under the current growth plan, it has a delineated built up area. It has a designated greenfield area. It has an urban uh, area identified to it. And ultimately over the long term, it has the potential to function similar to the, the, the county's other urban areas. But we do recognize that this area does have significant challenges to develop and is a long term priority for the county. So with respect to employment lands, we took a further look at the employment land needs analysis, and we also decided that we need to do a further deeper dive on looking at really what the vision is for employment within Brant County over the long term. That work is still being undertaken, but what we have updated right now is the land needs assessment for the county's employment areas. And what we've identified is that ultimately there is a need for more land within the uh, 403 business park to accommodate forecast industrial type development over the long term. Our previous analysis had identified a need of about 105 hectares, but given the need for larger, uh, larger sites and greater market choice of, of size, uh, sorry, of sites by size and configuration and location to accommodate uh, potential growth in export based sectors like manufacturing, warehouse distribution, wholesale trade, 
and other industrial type developments, we felt there was a need to increase the overall amount of land required uh, for the 403 business park. And so that has been adjusted to 250 hectares. We've identified that through a needs assessment that can be justified uh, in our opinion. We, uh, we also would note that the proposed PPS has identified that you can go longer now when you're looking at the need for employment lands. So previously, the PPS said you can only project out over a 25 year period. Now it's saying that's a minimum requirement for projections and that you can project employment areas longer. And we do feel that, that is, uh, that's an important uh, consideration to look at. We feel there's merit to, to look at a, a larger area of land to make sure we have that sufficient choice of, of lands by uh, location and, and size. And so this just provides you a summary of where those lands are identified. And so looking at um, uh, lot configurations and ensuring we have discernible edges between uh, the urban and rural fabric, we've, we've increased that land requirement just slightly further to 276 hectares. And you can see the areas in the hatching in the uh, blue and the light uh, gray there. These are the areas that we've added to the, uh, we're proposing to add to the 403 business park. With respect to the rural employment area, we also would note that there are many rural employment areas within the County of Brant. These are areas that are typically serviced uh, with dry services. They don't have municipal water uh, and wastewater services. And they are an important aspect and element to the overall uh, county's urban structure and economic development potential. Ultimately, we feel that these, the need for uh, future expansions of employment areas should be reviewed and evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis based on the merits of the development, uh, as well as uh, existing provincial and local policies. So in terms of next steps, we have an employment land strategy that I, our employment area strategy that I mentioned is underway, and that's to be released in the fall of this year. That's gonna provide more foundational work in terms of the overall vision uh, and um, strategic direction with respect to the, the future um, uh, planning for employment areas within the county. I'll leave it to that. I think that's probably a good enough uh, summary there. And then lastly, with respect to growth monitoring. So this really does include the uh, work that we've done through the comprehensive review analysis. And so we've been in this situation now for three years, working through this, and we're finally at this point. But we're really not done yet at this point. This is really just the beginning in some ways, because what we've really done through this growth management strategy and MCR is we've, per we've really built a database. And we've built a database that has a significant amount of data that is ultimately there, um, a lot of it under the surface for the county to monitor and report on over the, the coming years. And this is gonna be really critical for the county to do, particularly given the environment that we're in now with the proposed PPS and um, Bill 97 and other le legislative changes that have occurred and will continue to occur with this government. So we do feel that there's a need to really emphasize the need for monitoring as well as benchmarking of, of growth trends with respect to the forecast to ultimately make sure that we're prepared and we're ultimately nimble in our ability to identify and, 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 and um, ultimately react and uh, adjust to uh, a changing, a changing um, policy environment as well as a changing economic and demographic and, and development environment. Ultimately, we feel that this policy tool really should develop and evolve, not just as a growth tracking model, but really a growth management tool that could ultimately allow us to run sensitivity analysis, run uh, potential scenarios, what if scenarios for growth, depending on what sort of development applications may uh, end up coming uh, our way in the next few years. We could also look at how are we tracking with respect to density, intensification, uh, employment absorption, and all sorts of other things. So we are engaging with the, uh, the county to consider uh, starting that work possibly uh, sometime later this year. So that concludes my presentation and I'm uh, happy to turn it over to um, back to, to uh, the council for any questions. Thank you, Jamie. Are there any questions of clarification from the council to the presenter? Councillor Oakley. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want some clarification on the, the reasoning behind adding Burford back in. Uh, I understand there were some, some comments from the province, but looking at the population build-out slide from Paris and St. George, um, even taking out Burford out of the equation, we, we still have the potential within uh, to far surpass the 2051 goal and get to 70,000 people. So I, I don't really see the um, reasonings behind adding in Burford, particularly when you look at the servicing challenges um, 
acknowledging that it's it's uh, more, far more efficient uh, to build infrastructure in uh, in denser environments and, and two urban environments rather than three. So I'm I'm kind of not following that logic there. And through you, Mr. Mayor, it's a great question. We um, we definitely did sort of grapple with this issue for quite a while, given the um, situation that we know exists within Burford right now with the challenges to service the area. Um, so really does to, to bring us back to the, the sort of foundational reason why is that when we're looking at the land needs assessment, and so all this work was done under the framework of the provincial growth plan, mm -hmm. the, the land needs assessment methodology that was prepared by the growth plan, and all the documents that go along with that, that those reports, and ultimately the the growth plan identified in 2006 a built up area around all of the urban settlement areas in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and that included Burford. It also identified a designated greenfield area for all the urban settlement areas in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which included Burford. So because Burford has an existing uh, established population, because it has a uh, it has characteristics of, a, of an urban settlement area, and it's also recognized in the official plan as an urban settlement area, for all those reasons it was identified in the uh, provincial growth plan as being part of the urban system. And so even though there are challenges to develop Burford over the long term, it does still reflect an area that would be uh, considered an urban area and ultimately if services were to be provided for that area and resolved, it could, it could accommodate future urban growth similar to an area like St. George or Paris, but recognizing that it does have significant challenges to do so. So we've identified that there are limits to how much growth Burford is going to accommodate in the near term and likely over the 2021 to 51 period. But for the purposes of the technical approach to the urban land use assessment, Burford was identified to be, continue to be part of the urban system. Thank you. Councillor Bell, we're going to go to you next and then Councillor House. Councillor Bell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to our presenter. Um, Jen talked about fundamental assumptions. And I have a question about the fundamental assumption that you have um, referred to a couple of times, and, and that is that 59,000 people uh, is the right number that we should be using for planning purposes. And I struggle with the logic, and I think your own, your own um, presentation of the removal of the excess lands policy just reinforces my trouble in understanding the logic. We had a, a route to 59,000 before we removed the excess lands policy. Uh, the excess lands policy, once gone, opens up, certainly in, in Paris, and, and, and I guess elsewhere, uh, to have an awful lot more people, a lot, lot more building, a lot more residents coming to us. So 59, you have said, on numerous occasions, is the minimum. I would like to understand what you think is the most likely, because that's the basis, I think, on which we, as a county, should be planning. If we plan for the minimum, we're almost certain to fail in some respect along the way. And, and I would like to have your, uh, if you could repeat your rationale for why we should stick with 59, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, uh, I would love to do that through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Mr. Bell. Uh, it's definitely a, a challenging uh, exercise to try to project growth over a long-term period. And I'll be the first to admit that. I project uh, population forecasts all over Ontario, and I've been doing it for the last two decades, and when we go out over the long-term period, our ability to accurately project growth uh, further and further out becomes less accurate, uh, just because of the challenges inherently in uh, that type of analysis. Regardless of those challenges, obviously we, uh, we continue to uh, embark on those long-term projections. I'm looking at the long-term uh, rate of growth for the province as a whole, and ultimately uh, the key, some of the key geographic regions within Ontario. So first of all, looking at that broader sort of regional context, and then ultimately looking at what are the factors that are driving growth within that regional context to the county of Brand. And so when we look at the overall amount of growth that's occurred in, uh, in Brand historically and over the last few years, we know that Brand has been a relatively uh, strong growth area and it has picked up steam. As I mentioned, um, COVID had an accelerating impact on that. But we do see that relative rate of growth starting to moderate now um, over the forecast period, at least in the next few years. We do anticipate that that demand for growth will be strong and that the trajectory for growth is higher. We do expect that we're going to see more growth 
occurring in Brent relative to what we've been experiencing in the past as an average. But there are a number of constraints and challenges to projecting the long-term maximum potential for, for uh, Brant and ultimately its urban areas over the long term because of the servicing challenges that exist today and ultimately the timing of servicing and the ability to overcome those challenges. And so uh, those challenges exist in Paris, they exist in, they exist in um, St. George as well obviously in Burford. We can provide scenarios and we have um, looked at different uh, rates of growth in our previous work to look at higher rates of growth and lower rates of growth and ultimately we still come back to 59,000 being a reasonable long-term projection for growth and one of the key reasons why I keep coming back to that 59,000 is because you're going to require about a 50% increase in annual housing growth and about a 55% increase in net migration on a year a year over year basis for the next 20 years to even achieve that minimum so that's the first reason when we look at the long-term projections and the opportunity for higher growth, the real reason we need to really understand that increment between the growth forecast of 51 and the build out is because we need to understand, well, what is that delta or that difference between ultimately what that forecast is in 51 and ultimately what we might be required to service over that long-term period. So when we do development charge background studies, for example, and we look at water and wastewater services, we're typically more concerned about the build out of the urban envelope of land and how much how much of that envelope will be serviced? Ultimately, what are the re requirements? What are the costs? But we typically don't try to nail down the timing of build out because ultimately that timing is very difficult to project. In my opinion, again, the timing of build out to achieve that additional growth that we've identified on, on those surplus lands will be well beyond 2051. It'll take us well into this century. And while there's a need to understand that amount of growth, from a servicing perspective, trying to nail the timing down exactly is very difficult. So what I would recommend you do is you continue to understand the amount of growth that would be required to service all of those urban lands and then monitor that growth on an annual basis. And then during the next five year official plan review uh, or the next uh, time you do ultimately embark on your OP update, uh, you'll have monitored that growth and you'll be able to then make a more accurate decision, hopefully with a uh, completed uh, servicing master plan study that will tell us exactly when and how those lands are going to be serviced and where we're going to focus our, our efforts for growth. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm not convinced by that argument, I'm sorry. Um, I, I do think that the evidence is, certainly over the last few years, uh, you were 50% out on the estimate of growth in Paris in between your MCR and the census. Everything I see, at least in my part of Paris, in the South End, is building like you know, crazy. And I see more new starts. I see new starts on the Nith Peninsula. I see new starts on live developments. I see new starts everywhere. I cannot help but believe that Paris is growing so fast that you're going to be miles off on, the, on, the est on your estimates. And I see a lot of pressure. Now that we are going to move away from the excess lands policy, I see pressure will come from Sifton, it will come from Cord, and it will come from TCA, not to wait until the tail end of 2021 to 2051, but to go as fast as they possibly can. I don't think that we fully understand the, the uh, mindset of the developers here. They want to go as fast as they can. We have given them essentially a green light to go as fast as they can and to use all that surplus land that we had uh, identified in our excess lands policy. So. I'm sorry, I simply don't don't uh, see that. I think we should be much more prudent in terms of planning for the future. We're just about to build a new water treatment plant in, in St. George. We're about to build one, an, an expansion in Paris. I don't believe we've actually got the right numbers for the size of those plants. And, and I, will, I think we'll be finding ourselves in a very short time having to build again or extend again. So I, I think we should, in, in, if we're going to be uh, good governors of our county, we should look at what is most likely rather than what is minimum. And I'll leave it at that. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Uh, these are questions of clarification only. Councillor Howes, you're next, and then Councillor Pierce, followed by Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, delegation. Um, so I I'm, I'm guess I'm going to carry on a little bit on the traffic analogy that the red light, green light part that Councillor Bell initiated. but. Um, I think back to the, the last term of council in 2019, we tapped the brakes on new residential um, 
uh, development applications and uh, <clears throat> just looking at your chart, uh, a year later we had the highest level of building um, that our community has ever seen with 713 dwellings that year, which was like way higher than ever experienced before. And that, that just is an il illustration that there's a pipeline and there are, there are units in the pipeline. Um, and even if you tap the brakes, there's still gonna be lots of houses built. My question for you is just, just for the, the simplest of clarifications, if we never see another development application after today, is that pipeline currently already full enough that we're gonna hit the, the targets that are imposed upon us by the province by 2051? Yes, as I, as I pointed out, um, when you look at the overall amount of, of development in the pipeline and ultimately our, and so there's, a, there's, a, there's some numbers there you have to sort of walk through, or I have to walk through, I guess, again, just to be clear that we have in our pipeline, we have, so we have, we've got 3,430 units in the pipeline. Uh, sorry, let me go to Paris. We have 3,630 units in the pipeline, and we have 4,200 units in the demand forecast. So you can see we're quite close already to, the pipeline is very close to the forecast by 2051. We wouldn't require a lot more development to be added to the pipeline to hit that 51 number. If I'm answering your question uh, correctly, Mr. House. Uh, almost. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, the, but if you add in St. George, because that was a Paris number you just gave, right? That's right. So if you add in St. George and what's already in its pipeline, the two numbers together surpass the target. That's right. For the County of Brant. That's right. The two numbers would have surpassed because we look at St. George, there's 3,400 units in the pipeline and there's 1,600 units in the forecast. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, I won't go any further on the last two, uh, although I, I agree with the statements that they're making there. My question is, on the slide where you've got the population build out of Paris and St. George, um, in the, I guess I'll call it brownish yellow color, you've got existing population. What, when was that taken? I believe that is the 2000 and, uh, should be the, the current population is of 2023. Okay. I can double check with you though, for you. That's fine, thank you. Councilor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a few questions to Jamie. Well, I can't believe it's been at this for two decades. <laughs> uh, just to be clear, these housing units that you're showing, that doesn't include ARUs, correct? It includes, it includes all development, includes um, new development with respect to secondary units, it includes high density, um, it includes low density. Um, sorry, remind me, uh, what um, are the, the ARUs? Remind me what the Additional ARU? residential units. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all new growth. It's all, it's all new development that we're looking at um, in a five-year incremental period. Does it include ARUs? That's what I'm asking. It's, 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 all, new, it's all new residential units. New residential. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, second question of clarification. There's three total. Um, you said a dynamic growth management tool. Um, you talked about looking at density, uh, the number of applications coming in, a few other things. Is anybody using, <laughs> any municipalities out there using a, a dynamic growth management tool that we could copy or look at or? There's, so there's one. So we've, we've developed a prototype for the city of Brantford. Uh, sorry, Bramp, Brampton. I, I apologize. Uh, and that, that tool is now in the works where we've, we've prepared a, a, uh, an initial, uh, initial document or initial model that we've reviewed with the, with the city. And we're now looking to finalize that tool right now. And with that prototype being developed, we're now looking to talk to the county about how that tool could be ultimately could be utilized and customized for the county brand. And it's essentially a really a, a web-based tool that's really automated and takes the, the work that we've done here and all the spatial analysis that we've done and it really allows that to be looked at um, through, um, um, uh, through a computer application that ultimately uh, 
automates that process of querying, storing data, and then reporting out on data. And it's ultimately, as I said, a tool that we feel will evolve. It has a lot of potential to add capacity and, and sophistication through other growth management types of um, uh, benchmarking and, and uh, types of um, assessments that ultimately we think are important in a growth management strategy, but ultimately it's still in its infancy. Um, and so we're quite excited about it, actually, because we think it's a real critical tool to, uh, to use, to, to monitor, uh, and ultimately, again, given the, the legislative environment we're in, I think it's more important than ever that you're built, you have the ability to be ready and, and be, um, be uh, responsive to change. Okay. Now, I appreciate that because uh, given where we are, where we think we're going to be, I think that will come in handy. So I leave, leave, I, I will follow up with staff and see that that's coming on. Last question of clarification, Mr. Mayor. Um, I appreciate the work you did on the urban employment needs. Um, and you're saying we need, I think, another 250 hectares versus uh, when you first said, uh, looked at, you thought we needed 110 in Paris. And we had five extra in St. George, I give us 105. My question is, because um, you touched on it, and, and you did it. I don't know who did the analysis on the parcels around the 403, but that, that was great work. You know, you, you, you looked at it, you, you put it through the framework, and it was beautiful. You know, uh, we don't want to fragment agricultural land. It's close, blah, blah, blah. So you did a great job. In light of our delegations tonight, I want to pick your brain for a second, and that's uh, rural employment lands. Um, you you didn't, or maybe you weren't paid to, um, do an analysis of do we have enough rural employment land? So um, when we look at that, the framework policy, we're not looking at, okay, do we need more, but we're look, just we're basically going on a, a one-off, I guess, and, and does it make sense for that area? Could you just kind of clarify that for, for uh, later on? Yes, uh, and to you, Mr. Mayor. So when we, when we started off this, this process back in 2019, ultimately, we were, or, or at that time, we were working with the, the current uh, provincial policy framework, and we still are essentially uh, uh, working through that, that framework. And the, ultimately, what the LNA, the Land Use Assessment Guidelines, uh, say to us is that the real focus of the Land Use Assessment is in the urban system. So that's an area where we're projected to and anticipate to accommodate most of the growth most of the large-scale development, whether it's residential or non-residential, will be accommodated in the urban system. And that urban system is really your fully serviced settlement areas and your fully serviced employment areas. But it does also recognize that rural employment areas are important and they play a, a critical role to the ultimate economic potential uh, and the structure of the, the, the county's uh, land use system. Now, I will note, and we've, we've criticized that land use assessment document several times that it really was written, you know, in Toronto. It's a document that was really written for large-scale urban municipalities, and it doesn't necessarily really pick up on some of those rural nuances. So there was a need to, to go through and look at those rural areas on a site-by-site -site basis, and so we did that. And But we also looked at, well, what is the growth plan saying about the rural area in terms of the need for expansion, and ultimately, and then how much land do we have, and is there a need? And so... A couple of things we noted was one, there is a significant amount of rural land that is available and ha that's um, designated for rural employment use within the county. And there's more rural land than we would identify there being demand for over the, the 30 year period. So we have a surplus of rural land. But the focus, again, it was not really specifically to try to get into a deep quantitative assessment of the rural area, either for employment or residential. But we did acknowledge that there's a significant amount of rural land. The growth plan also identifies that when we're looking at expansions in the rural area, we're really not looking to bring in new rural areas uh, from scratch or in, that ha don't exist today. We're really looking to accommodate the existing needs of users in the rural areas uh, as of today. So if you have a rural use, um, whatever that use may be, uh, and there's a need for an expansion to accommodate a, uh, an expansion of that use, there would be, that would, in our opinion, be an appropriate um, uh, request to, to examine and likely we would approve that and we have identified that in the report. But we are not looking at the expansion of new employment areas in the rural area simply because there is a significant amount of supply and the focus is really on the urban system and that 403 business part. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Chambers, you're next. My questions are similar to what David uh, has asked, and, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, 
rationalize what you just said as, as the answer to his question, which really doesn't answer my question, although the question is very similar. And it's to do with uh, rural employment areas. Uh, if I compare the two interchanges on 403, at Rest Acres Road, you're classifying that as an urban area. At uh, Middletown Line, that would be classified as a rural area. Is, is, am I correct on that? Is, is that my understanding? Correct. The Middletown Line one being the... Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to recall. Is that the one on 25? Or uh, I'm trying to get my map, my map, mental map here. So that area, yeah, it's, it's, so it's outside of the settlement area boundary. It's not, it doesn't have any municipal services and there's no plans right now to provide municipal services to that area. So it's going to function as a dry employment area or a rural employment area. And, and, and you're saying that uh, our, our focus are, should be, at least what our plan is focusing on is um, uh, urban employment land expansion rather than rural employment land expansion. You're saying that rural employment land expansion is to be done on a case by case. Um, and, and I'm failing to understand why in terms of designating employment lands, why we should not be focusing on interchanges even though it may be rural or urban. In, in my opinion, mm -hmm. we can never have enough designated employment lands and the opportunity to designate employment lands, whether it be rural or urban, uh, we, we should be welcoming the designations and you're contradicting that philosophy. Similarly, uh, we, we have uh, transportation routes, uh, and I'll use Bishop's Gate, for example, and Highway uh, 532 through Canesville that uh, it, it may transition from urban to rural on, on 532, but th there's a, an opportunity there for designations. And if we are of the opinion that we want to have employment lands because that is good uh, because we have a whole bunch of residential growth. We need to accompany that with employment land growth for assessment purposes. So why are we not uh, with, with uh, determination designating employment lands in rural areas that uh, would help our assessment base. And through you, Mr. Mayor, so it's a great question, and we did, um, and, I, and I support the, the sort of line of thinking on this, and we did look at this very thoroughly when we went through the MCR process at, at um, all the urban and rural areas, and that particular one on uh, County Road 25 was a real critical one, given its access and uh, exposure and it was, and I think in the previous uh, uh, official plan, it does have a, um, a designation as a as a, a prime employment area. But so there's a few issues. One, you have to go back and look at the, the framework that we prepared the work in. That framework was in and is um, largely prepared within the framework of the 2020 PPS and the growth plan and the land needs assessment document. That document is, it has. Um, a process that you have to follow in terms of looking at what is the overall amount of, uh, first of all, what is considered urban, what is considered rural. So we talked about that. What is the LNA, the Land Use Assessment Methodology, and the Growth Plan considered to be an urban area and a rural area? And so for the purposes of employment areas, typically areas that are outside of a settlement area that aren't serviced are typically identified as part of the rural system. So that was one of the issues that we looked at. We also have to look at the overall amount of employment growth. How much employment growth do we think we're going to accommodate over the long term, over the next 10, 20, 30 years? And then how does that employment relate to land when we look at the employment growth and the densities? So we went back and we looked at that and we said, well, we don't want to necessarily bring in 
rural lands into the urban system where we don't feel there's a real opportunity for those lands to be prioritized and service in the near term. We think there's a much better opportunity to plan for the 403 business park because there's already an established uh, urban employment area there. There's the potential to service that area in the near term. And there's market demand there as well as there could be in another area like you mentioned. But if we, under the previous framework, if we start bringing in more land into the urban area, then ultimately that's going to sort of create a, uh, a competition, so to speak, between one urban area to another urban area. So if we, if we focus on the uh, 25, uh, Highway 25 area rather than 403, it's hard to justify all those lands being brought in. At least it was under the, the previous policy framework. Now, under the proposed framework, the, the framework is now trying to remove some of that uh, prescriptiveness from the assessment approach. And it's also trying to remove barriers in terms of how much land that we can identify um, in, an, in, an, um, in, a, in a municipality for employment area growth. We looked at, um, prior to uh, having um, that document, we looked at just this, this sort of common sense approach to how much development do we think is potentially needed in Brant County in the urban area to accommodate uh, urban employment growth. And we felt that it is beyond the amount of growth that we can adjust, we can justify through just the simple math of the LNA ass assessment, which is basically just employment growth times that by density, that gives you a land requirement. So we said we need to have more land. We need to look at market contingencies. We need to have accommodation for the fact that some of these lands aren't going to all develop in uh, the rest of Paris. We need to have, um, we need to broaden out the, the, the designation looking at discernible edges and that got us up to the 276 number. We feel there's a need to go higher because there's a need to have critical mass, you need to have choice for, for employment areas by size, and by location, by designation, zoning. And based on the amount of demand that we anticipate coming to, to, uh, to Brant County and um, ultimately what that uh, demand is going to need, we felt that that 276 hectare designation at this time is sufficient. That doesn't, at this point, it doesn't preclude you from looking at other areas that you want to uh, focus in on in the future at a later date. And so this is, again, coming back to the monitoring tool, that if you want to look at bringing more lands in for employment area uh, use because you're finding the absorption is much faster, similar to the residential question, that, that there's nothing precluding you from monitoring that and looking at that. But it's going to require a significant amount of study to figure that out. Ultimately, you're going to need to know First of all, is it an urban environment you're looking at on that um, uh, area that we spoke about, or is it still a rural type setting that you're looking at in terms of what kind of employment you're accommodating? And if it's transitioning to more urban, ultimately, which is what we would expect to see if we're looking at developing a large scale uh, business park, then you need to have a servicing strategy out outlined to figure out how you're going to service that, that, that development. So again, there's nothing pre from precluding you to do that but you do need to study that. And I think that's beyond the scope right now of where we're at. Uh, if you're going to leave the lands in their rural uh, sort of state, I think that would be questionable whether you'd want to do that because ultimately you've got a real prime piece of real estate along the 403 and to develop that area for a low order, low density use, ultimately I think it's really going to uh, understate the market potential of that area over the long term. So I think you'd probably be shortchanging yourself to ultimately develop that area as a large-scale rural area on the, on the 403. Just a, 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 a follow-up and a, a, a conclusion. With regard to Middleton Line and, and 403, it will be a long time before that is ever urban. <laughs> it is in the middle of nowhere, but it has uh, an, a very uh, large assessment base there now. Uh, and if you look at what's there now, and it's not serviced, and that's an example of what can happen in a urban, or rather a rural area that is uh, has certain amenities other than servicing. And the other thing that uh, you may wish to comment, hypothetically, if, if a municipality, in order to offset uh, its expanding residential growth, takes it upon itself to aggressively and with purpose try to recruit industrial economic or employment land assessment. How does that factor in your uh, projections? Uh, Brant County needs to 
moderate its residential assessment because uh, the, the ratio is, is not good and it needs to be better. And if we aggressively try to correct that ratio, the ratio between residential and in employment, how does that factor into what we should be designating? In my mind, and you can uh, correct me, in my mind, we should be designating additional lands, as many lands as we can, to uh, entice uh, development on those lands, because the more lands you have, the more uh, opportunity you have to, um, to market them. It's just an uh, observation. Uh, and through you, Mr. Mayor, it's a good observation. I, I get this question a lot in terms of, you know, what is the appropriate assessment ratio? What is the optimal ratio? And we know in Brant, the ratio is not optimal. You know, I think your ratio is probably somewhere around 80-20, maybe not even at that, that rate. And ultimately, the challenge is, is that in all fast-growing municipalities, because your population is growing so quickly, and because your employment is also growing, but it's growing at a similar pace, maybe a, hopefully a little faster, it's very hard to move the needle on with respect to that overall tax ratio. So when you start running scenarios, and I've done this for many municipalities in the past, to so look at well, what would be the optimum scenario that we'd like to get to, how much employment growth would that be, you ultimately end up running into more targeted type scenarios in terms of this is what we'd like to have at a desired state over the long term with our assessment ratio. But is that really is that really realistic given the amount of development pressure we're seeing on residential and ultimately the overall market potential for, for non-res? So it's something that you can look at and there's nothing again to prevent you from going down that road to look at scenarios that would explore the impact of adding more growth and what that would be on have on your assessment. I say I would say right now that Honestly, if you're going to look to that area to be something more than it is today, I think it's there's nothing again preventing you from doing that. I think right now it has there's lands that are designated for rural employment. You can you can accommodate rural development there now. But if you're looking to expand that area, I would have said it, you know, under the previous um, which is still the current planning policy framework, the growth plan, it would be very hard to get approval to do that because it really says right in the document that you are only allowed to expand rural employment areas to accommodate existing businesses. So there may be, there may be some ways to get through that you know, under the, the previous uh, legislation. Under the current legislation, there's a lot more uh, opportunity now to do other things that you probably couldn't have done in the past. But I do think that it is something that requires further study. And um, it's something that if it's of interest to council, we have time. We're working on our employment strategy. And we can always add that into the, uh, to the analysis if that's something that uh, would be uh, requested, and we can determine ultimately um, from that what what may need to come out of it. But I think at this time, um, I think it's probably premature to to really understand fully what where we're going with that, because there's a lot of things to think about. Given the amount of changes we're seeing with the policy framework, and t would that really make sense to develop that area as a large scale rural area, uh, as you're suggesting? Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor Coleman. You're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I guess it's more maybe of a comment. I, I don't want to ever see us lose our ability to attract, as I call it, high-end industry along the 403. That's where I believe they want to go, high-end. And, and, and you fully need services to accommodate that. But I don't ever want to lose fact of the areas that we have in this municipality that right now are basically on dry services. One of them's out in the far end, a huge employer. The other one's up there on 25, and I think we have that potential in the Canesville area too. So I don't want to ever see us lose the fact of that. So if we can do something to uh, help that along, or we need a strategy on an employment plans down, the, down in the future, I'm all for it. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Are there any other questions of clarification? Oh, Councillor Bell, you have your hand up there. Sorry about that. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll try to use the technology. Uh, a question, it, it may be more for uh, Pam or, or Jen, but I think Jamie can probably answer it as well. Uh, in the um, official plan, we talk about inclusionary zoning. I, I wanted to raise the more general point that I, I think we've got a great report here, but we seem not to have the focus on affordable and attainable housing that I had hoped for. And when I saw the in 
the uh, section on inclusionary zoning, my uh, hopes were raised. And I wonder whether you could say whether it's possible for us to use inclusionary zoning with our developers. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, and through you, uh, Mr. Bell, Jen's going to respond to this question. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, is uh, before Councillor Bell, I believe that's a question for tomorrow's deliberation, but are we, we have to finish with Jamie's presentation at the moment? Can I ask Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I think we should keep, keep to the clarification of the presenter. So I think with that being said, are there any other questions from Council? Seeing none, thank you, Jamie, for your report, your study. Uh, we'll move on now to number five on the agenda which is the beginning of our delegations. Again, I want to remind everyone in the room that these no decisions are going to be made today. We have no comments. We have no uh, prejudice against anyone who's going to speak today. Um, please be respectful. The first one on the docket is 5.1, which is Stubby's out in uh, New Durham. And I think Andy's here and someone else is here. Could you please state your name and your address when you get to the podium, please, just for the clerk. And we are going to give you a one-minute warning in your 10-minute time, just so that we can keep on track. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I think um, we'll, we'll keep our delegation short. My name is Brandon Fluelling, and I'm a planner with GSP Group. And I'm joined today as well by Mr. Andy Stubby from Stubby's Precast. And we've got a, a short uh, site-specific request that we'd like to walk Council through. Um, and our timing is probably perfect following the, uh, the recent comments of, uh, of Council with questions. So just to quickly walk you through, on the, the left side of the page is our existing official plan, the 2012 official plan designation of the, uh, the Stubby's property. Um, you can see in blue being uh, the extent of their employment land designation in that, uh, in that graphic, with the red outline being the limits of the, of the property. In the 2022 release of the official plan, uh, you can see the area in blue as being an expansion to that employment area designation, or the limits of it. Um, and that came on the, on the heels of a, a site-specific request that we filed on behalf of Stubbies, um, planning for the long-term growth of their operations. Um, and through review and supporting documents, which I'll go through in momentarily, um, we thought this was the right amount of, of future growth area that would be required. Uh, but however, as, as times change and uh, you know another year had gone on, we've re since revised our request and um, looking for, again, a site-specific uh, amendment to the to 2022 version of the official plan or the final version that goes forward to further revise the uh, employment limits as they, um, as they surround the Stubby's property. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the area in blue, which was the 2022 official plan expanded employment area. Um, you can see some areas in uh, a brown shade, I'll call it on the left-hand side, and then a red, uh, a red outline. So the revised request would be to expand the employment area to the red outline area and maintain the, the blue area as well. The, the brown areas, which are along the, the frontage of the property, um, they could remain as agricultural because the, the intent is not to use this land for uh, at, in, in front of the plant for outdoor storage or, or for anything plant related. The existing operations, as you're all quite, very well quite aware, um, are set back from the road. You sort of, you can drive down and if you're you know, just focusing on the road, you might not know exactly the extent of the operations that are located there. And the intent would be to, to sort of carry that, that framework forward. So expand the employment designation to, to the rear of the operations and um, uh, maintain sort of the agricultural frontage because it's, it's not an area where Stubbies would be looking to store excess product or materials or that type of thing. So that's, the, that's our request would be to expand the employment area to include all of the red lands uh, as well as the blue that was identified in the, the previous or the 2022 version of the official plan. Now, to support this request, we had previously submitted a letter in um, January of 2021. That was at the time of comments for the, the original official plan review. 
Um, and that was supported with an agricultural impact statement submitted at that same time as well. More recently, we've updated our, our planning justification request and the agricultural impact assessment to, to further review is the area that we've identified in the red appropriate from, a, from an MDS, an agricultural impact assessment perspective, as well as from a, a land needs uh, PPS growth plan uh, perspective as well. So all of that material has been submitted and the, the expansion of the employment area has been drawn based on that basis. Um, and, and now I'll just, I'll let Andy sort of speak to why have we submitted this request and what is the need for the, the additional employment area with the um, Stubby's operations? So uh, as you mentioned, my name's Andy Stubby, kind of been in the village of New Durham all my life, I guess. That's where I was born and grew up. Um, we originally, a few years ago, asked to bring the employment lands right to the Muir line, to the right to the road, uh, just because um, the business is expanding. But it's always set a bit off with me because I really like to keep, just for, as uh, Brandon mentioned, I like to keep that rural looking uh, farmland or agriculture alongside the road. It's quite a large strip there actually, but it just looks good, looks better. And then we had the uh, opportunity to purchase the land or the farm to the uh, east of the property. So we were asking that to be designated into employment lands and mostly for storage. Um, not more, not for buildings, but for storage. So we, we do, do have a lot of storage. When you people drive past, you see a lot of a lot of storage there, and we, we call that our elastic band. So if, if something, we always like to keep our people employed, and so if all of a sudden a uh, job gets delayed, and they do, we build high-rise construction sometimes, a lot. Um, if something gets um, delayed, we can actually put it in the yard and still keep my, my plants going most efficient way as possible. In fact, we have never laid off people, ever. Um, so that's nice that we can actually use that elastic band, I call it, to, to um, keep the uh, whole system running efficiently as we can. So that's what we're asking for. Thank you. Uh, does council have any questions of clarification only? Councillor Miller and then Councillor Pierce, and their only questions of Clarification. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the outdoor storage then in your proposed plan um, wouldn't be, uh, you couldn't see it from the road. Is that, is, is that, is that the intent? That is correct, yes. Because, okay. uh, yeah, there are some other employment areas where it just doesn't look nice. So um, I don't know how it looks through a policy point of view framework, but uh, I, I, do, I do support that idea. So, okay, thank you very much. We don't want to show any support today. That's tomorrow's business. Um, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so for clarification, you want to add the entire parcel to the east? Uh, by the looks of the, the picture you had on there, there's, um, looks as though there's like trees and forests and stuff in there. So I, I, would, I would assume that the entire parcel will not be used for storage. So I'm curious as to why you're looking to add the entire parcel when you won't be using the entire parcel. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. So. In fact, the entire parcel is not being added. It, there, there are limits to the south. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm still, still sharing screen, but um, there are limits to the south of the, the additional lands that have been required uh, acquired that would not have the employment designation. Um, and part of that was due to the agricultural impact assessment and MDS setback concerns. Um, so that, that has not been included. And this, this mapping has been provided to staff to outline you know, where that employment designation would go. Um, it does include the woodlot at the top, um, sort of for ease of boundary purposes, but the intent is not to, not to just go clear, and clear cut and pave the woodlot by any means. It's to have that additional elastic area, as, as Andy said. Any further development out there would need site plan approval as well, and we'd have to look at, you know, those details at that time. No, and I, I appreciate that, but where I'm going with this is, as you know, there's a number of delegations tonight that are looking for more land to be put in. Hypothetically, I'm going to say, let's say you've got um, 100 acres, but you're only going to use 50 of it. I'm just curious as to, you know, would you, would you look to just put the 50 acres in rather than the 100 to kind of spread it around, so to speak? If I may, part of part of the request actually removed what was previously identified as um, for employment lands going right up to the road. Right. So we, we've taken that out 
And um, we've really limited it to the size that we think is, is necessary and appropriate for future growth. Um, it, 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 um, it, it's a balance of removing some along the road, but then have, maintaining that flexibility to the rear. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of the delegation? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. 5.2 on the agenda is Dave Aston um, for TCA Bishopsgate Burford Settlement Area Boundary Expansion Request. That's a lot. Good evening, Mayor Bailey. It's, it's a lot, but it's a little. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity to speak this evening and then take a moment to just congratulate staff on uh, completing this official plan and bringing this forward to you for consideration. I know uh, the amount of work and effort that it takes to prepare a brand new official plan, work through a comprehensive review, and uh, meet with the public and the province and endure multiple changes to policies. And I'm sure that there was quite a bit there. And uh, so I just want to thank staff for all of their work in pulling this together. I also want to let you know that your staff have been fantastic in response to uh, questions, clarifications, comments, and working with us, and I think the broader industry as it relates to this official plan. I think they've gone, gone above and beyond in making sure that there's been public consultation, uh, that there's been engagement uh, by stakeholders of interest. And again, just I just want to thank them for that. As a general comment, I, I want to suggest that as you're working on an official plan and doing municipal comprehensive reviews, while they may take years to complete, what you're approving now is a plan that is really a point in time. Uh, should this plan get adopted here and approved by the province, you're approving a plan now that really is a forward-looking document into 2051 and maybe even longer, depending on the types of planning decisions that you're making. So I think it's important that as you consider this plan, that you not get caught by constraints or considerations of today when looking ahead for tomorrow. Because there's a lot of work and study that can be done to address some of those issues. Servicing, for example. I know there's work being done on master servicing plans and servicing studies and there's solutions available for consideration. So I would encourage you to think forward beyond constraints of today, uh, challenges of density or other matters related to growth of today, and look into the future. Also, I would suggest to you that when we talk about land needs and residential lands and employment lands, that there's been a lot of work done and it looks at population forecasts and densities, but it's important, and I think it's been said and, and recognized by Mr. Cook that these are forecasts and things are changing in the province and things are changing in the county. I think you need to plan for the growth to occur and with a residential perspective, look at housing choice. And to Councillor Bell, I think housing choice is an important component of affordable and attainability. So don't constrain opportunity for housing choice in your community based on some calculations that may suggest there's a surplus of land. It's too important to not provide opportunity for choice over the longer term. And same with employment lands. Uh, Councillor Chambers, I, I think his comments were correct. As you're going in, in residential, you're growing in employment and those two work together. I think, again, you need to plan for that in the future and make sure there's flexibility to respond to the market. Uh, I think it's no surprise that the market for employment lands is growing in Grant County as land, other lands in the province are building out. And people are looking for opportunity around major transportation corridors and interchanges, and you have one. So look to the future. Uh, what I want to just speak to this afternoon is this 
also the specific request of TCA at Bishopsgate uh, Road. It's a later request and our apologies for that, that it didn't make the site specific list or maybe it did, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, but this has really evolved through discussions that have been somewhat recent and ongoing with uh, county staff as it relates to those lands uh, that are owned by TCA and a broader uh, look at servicing within that employment area of Bishopsgate. And what we're, we are requesting is really a site-specific policy at this point that would recognize that if there is a broader solution to servicing primarily at stormwater management and looking for uh, perhaps a public solution for a stormwater management pond for the area, that we could uh, look to uh, offsetting lands lost for public infrastructure in designation of employment lands to ensure an overall efficient use of the lands within that area. And I think that was covered off in my, my letter of submission. Um, uh, and I hope that you'll be deliberating on tomorrow. So I, again, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, just one other general comment I would make, I think uh, when there is discussion on moving the employment needle, I think there's a lot of work that the county does in supporting and encouraging and promoting employment growth. I also think that there's other agencies and factors namely the Ministry of Transportation, that need to be um, part of the discussion. And I know that uh, there are discussions ongoing, but I think it's becoming critical that solutions uh, be brought forward by the province to assist the municipality in supporting employment growth. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, today. Uh, we generally support uh, all of the other recommendations associated with the TCA lands uh, and uh, again look forward to uh, how council decides to move forward and working with staff on implementation into the future. Thanks Dave. Are there any questions of clarification for Dave? Councillor Miller. Yeah thank you Mr. Bay. <laughs> I, I just seen this the other day so you, you have to pardon my ignorance on the whole thing but the what you're showing on the map, the hashtag, this is these are the lands east of Bishop Gate, just to be clear. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. So the area in front of it, fronting Bishop's Gate, is that not already being used now or, or sold? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the portion of the TCA lands on the front that are blue are currently designated. Uh, they're not being used at this time. Uh, the lands to the north were subject to uh, recent approvals associated with employment lands. And so what what uh, we've been having discussion on is what is the comprehensive solution for stormwater management, yeah. as an example. And that's where it may end up on TCA lands, and I think that's where discussions are heading. So we just want to make sure that there's, you know, overall an efficient use of land when you're looking at development of employment lands in that area. Okay, I found a little confusing. So the hatched area, the, the, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's to work with that, the blue, like those two areas would work too. Okay. Yes. You're not correct. looking at building, you know, an industry behind an industry or anything. Okay. Like I say, I, I just got it and, and I didn't understand it. So appreciate the clarification. Any other questions for Dave? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. You'll be on our minds tomorrow. <laughs> takes us to 5.3 on the agenda, Adet, uh, representing IBI. just like to welcome you all to our world. It's a lot.
hard work. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I hope you were able to hear what I said. I apologize. Um, I'd like to thank staff very much for all their hard work and dedication in getting us here. I'm super impressed that you got all the work done and that we're actually here this evening. I didn't think you'd make it, but congratulations. <laughs> we had faith in you. <laughs> so the subject uh, property that I'm here to discuss uh, this evening uh, are two adjacent parcels along the, uh, the north side of 8th Concession Road. So collectively, uh, these parcels have 42 hectares of land in total, and the subject lands are located in the central portion of the county of Brant, adjacent to the community of Burford. While the majority of these lands are found in the outer edge of Burford, the southeastern portion of the subject lands are located within the settlement area boundary. The secondary settlement area boundary runs to the east, west, and north of the subject lands. So the 2012 County of Brant official plan identifies the eastern portion of the subject lands within the Burford settlement area and are designated as employment, while the remainder of the lands are designated uh, for agricultural. So also, as you can see, a portion, a small portion of the lands are already uh, zoned for M3. And the current county of Brand official plan, the draft, uh, plans for these lands to be designated as uh, employment lands, just the eastern portion of the subject lands as general employment within the Burford uh, settlement secondary area, while the remaining of the property is designated for prime agricultural, and it directly abuts Burford. So our request tonight is for the inclusion of the entire property to be included in the Burford settlement boundary and to be redesignated to general employment. The proposed request would also allow for the expansion of the existing rural business on the adjacent parcel to the east. These lands are currently located within the Burford settlement boundary and are designated for employment uses. So as you can see on the plan, the red dashed line is the entire parcel that we're uh, speaking of tonight. And then the portion on the right, the eastern portion, is uh, designated for employment. And then the rest of the lands are still uh, agricultural. So the, the blue area lands, the dashed line in the blue, are the lands that we are requesting to be included as well in the, uh, in the settlement area and as employment lands. So it's my opinion that the proposed request to expand the existing settlement boundary area of Burford would be considered a rural settlement boundary expansion, and the proposed employment land use on the site would be compatible with the surrounding lands. The site, uh, notably the existing and planned employment lands along Bishop uh, Gate Road, would also be compatible with including these lands. The proposed rural settlement boundary expansion would provide a logical extension of the employment lands in the county. We have completed a settlement boundary expansion criteria matrix regarding the proposed request. It's also my opinion that the proposed settlement area boundary expansion request for the subject lands addresses the criteria and demonstrates that the proposed request has regard for the six key themes and this can be found uh, in your package that, with our submission. The proposed settlement boundary expansion would result in the redesignation of the lands to employment, which is in line with the proposed surrounding designations and will accommodate the employment needs of the county. We respectfully request that the subject lands be included within the Burford urban settlement area boundary. The proposed settlement boundary expansion is a logical expansion of the settlement area as it rounds out the southeastern portion of Burford settlement area, and the proposed redesignation avoids the fragmentation of the subject lands and allows the lands to be utilized for employment needs. I thank you very much uh, for your time tonight, and I'm very happy to uh, provide any clarification or answer any questions. Thank you. Questions of clarification. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three, two, that, that, uh, can we go back to that presentation before we just wipe it right out? There we go. Okay, so if I'm looking at that picture, I see the blue. That, that the blue, the area in blue is the area you're referring to that you want to change. Um, now the area in white to the north of that, that that's oh, not owned by. Wait, uh, there's a better plan. There you go. 
I forgot to change the last slide. Okay. So if I look at the area to the north of that, yep. um, that's not owned by your... Um, no. Okay. So that it, that's to remain agriculture, or it still would be agriculture at this point? I can't answer that question for you, but I, I think that's in the, the intent. Plan, in, in the, the proposal, official plan, okay. according to that, yes. Okay. So my question to you is, um, you don't think we're fragmenting that section? with this uh, I believe plan. that that section might be for the residential expansion so what we're trying but I'm not sure um, I'm here just to talk about the parcel that we're here to ask for and again it's just to expand the existing um, industry that's uh, adjacent which is owned collectively by um, a group of partners that they have the logistics company that exists there now and they are looking to expand their business Okay. So what happens to the, the balance of the lands? I, I unfortunately don't have that information. It, it, okay, well, what, to, to me, it looks like it's going to be fragmented. So, But well, what I'm getting at is that you haven't talked to those landowners and neighbors. Or, okay, and we don't see a request before us either. So, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Bell, do you have your hand up? No. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It takes us to number 5.4 on the agenda, Rashika Anguish. Is she with us in the room? She's zoomed in. Maybe we can get rid of the, uh, the other um, presentation. There we go. Hello, Rashika. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of council. Sorry, I was not able to drive in today. Um, I have a very small presentation. Would you like me to share my screen or... Yes, please. Give that a try. Okay. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you again this evening um, to uh, let me delegate in front of you. Um, it's, uh, uh, again, it's a small presentation that I'll just quickly walk you through representing Mr. Wilbert Long from Long uh, Investments Inc. Um, the, the request is to include a portion of their, their lands for a minor settlement boundary expansion. The, the subject property is located on uh, Oak Hill Drive. It has frontage on Robinson Road as well. Uh, Mr. Long had, had made some submissions earlier uh, with the county with respect to inclusion of the entire uh, property. Um, and uh, we prepared uh, an analysis of provincial policy as well as official plan analysis in terms of justification for a minor rounding out uh, uh, of the settlement boundary. On this slide, uh, you can see uh, that only a portion of the property, which is located around here, fronting onto Oak Hill Drive, as a logical extension of uh, of the, the settlement. It is abutting existing residential homes. Uh, there's a there's an access point as well. And it runs on uh, municipal water is available on Oak Hill Drive as well. So we're we're making the request uh, to this council to consider um, the the inclusion of this portion. Um, in terms of uh, official plan the, the uh, slide better re represents how it will um, look like. Um, uh, again, uh, just just rationale as as compared to uh, looking at the surrounding land uses. Um, it is uh, as I mentioned, it's surrounded by residential uses uh, just immediately to the south. Um, we're considering this as a minor rounding up. Uh, of the existing Oak Hill settlement um, uh, boundary. It, it does have direct access to, to municipal infrastructure. Um, this portion of the property does not have uh, any specialty crop area or majority of these, uh, this portion is, is class four soil. Uh, so this um, uh, amended request, it, it meets the provincial direction will provide some additional housing in this area. Um, and uh, we uh, we believe this is compatible and there's a logical extension. Um, 
as I mentioned, it's just a brief presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Does council have any questions? Uh, Rashika, is that just a rounding out of Mr. Long's property and is that the property right next to the Young property? Uh, that's correct. It's uh, uh, it's only uh, four and a half acres or uh, hectares of land that is being asked. It's not the entire subject property. Uh, and uh, I'm only here on behalf of Mr. Mr. Long. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Coleman. Just for clarification, how many homes would that be, Rashika? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. At this time, we have not analyzed. Uh, there, there are some significant um, uh, grading um, uh, on that portion. So at this time, we have not done that further analysis in terms of how many homes can be accommodated. Um, so that exercise will, will still need to be undertaken. Not much of an answer, but it's an answer. Any other questions of clarification? Councillor Miller? Just, um, just at this, I think those houses, they're, they're on water, correct? But not sewage, am I correct? That's right, okay. To you, Mr. Mayor, yes, that's correct. You got it, Councillor Miller? Yeah, I think so, yeah, thank you. Okay, any, any other questions for Rashika? Seeing none, thank you, Rashika. Thank you very much. Thank you. Takes us to 5.5 .5 on the agenda, which is a, a ward to goading regarding uh, concession six lot 18 Glen Morris boundary expansion. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Bailey and the council members and staff for allowing me the opportunity to present this proposal today. Um, so we'll get right into it. It's a proposal for Glen Morris. The purpose of the delegation is to consider a settlement area boundary expansion to the hamlet of Glen Morris. It's also to change the land use designation from agriculture to village community area. It's requested that council include these changes in the soon to be adopted official plan and uh, any studies that would be deemed required would be provided. The proposal is for a new county road to traverse the Ternoning property uh, in direct line with the Folds Bridge and an 18 lot subdivision on the easterly side of the newly proposed road. Two additional lots on the west side of the proposed road would be for a Ternoning future residence and personal outbuilding. So the shaded area in blue is the area in question. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. So this gives you a, a, a little bit of an idea of what's going on here. The, the red line there is the current route that uh, a great deal of commuters use to go between Brantford, uh, Air, Kitchener, St. George, Paris. Uh, so it goes down Princess Street, and uh, it's very close to the school zone. The school is about 200 meters um, on Glen Morris Road. That's the Glen Morris Central Elementary School. Also on that uh, Princess Street route is the library at the bottom of the hill. So um, people take the route uh, up Glen Morris Road if they're coming from Brantford down Princess Street, was, which is a residential street with uh, 10 properties fairly close to the road. Uh, then they end up on East River Road, come up uh, to Folds Bridge and across the bridge that way. What we're proposing is a new route in green uh, that would cut directly across our property and over to Glen Morris Road. That's a, a little bit better idea of it. So the Folds Bridge is um, right. Uh, I don't know if this thing will work here. Sorry, no, it won't work on the screen. So the Folds Bridge is at the top. Glen Morris Road is on the bottom, and Princess Street. The residences on the one side of the street are on the left-hand side of the screen. The proposed subdivision would be on the right-hand side of the road. Sure. 
So traffic to and from Brantford, St. George, Air, Kitchener. They can currently use Princess Street as a link between East River Road and Glen Morris Road. Um, as I discussed, it's a, it's a residential street. It was always meant to be a residential street, and it's very close to the Glen Morris School. A uh, conservative estimate of the traffic flow utilizing this route through Princess Street would be six to 800 vehicles per day, uh, consisting of personal passenger vehicles, commercial dump trucks, 18-wheel transport trucks. Uh, the flow of traffic is constant throughout the day with the heaviest periods during the morning and afternoon commutes. So I have a brief uh, video here. So this is the property. Um, the area in purple is uh, the Trudonning property and the area in yellow at the top is the proposed community center site owned by the County of Brant at the moment. The area in red there that's just highlighted is the current route as we saw before. So this is actual drone footage from last week. Um, this is coming over the bridge. Uh, that's where the proposed road would cross. We'll cross the property. Um, you can see a little opening there just to the right of the cursor. So if you follow this car, this car is taking the route, not stopping at the stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> over the bridge okay so uh, you'll see it again so the drone just turned around and it the same footage so he just rotated the camera and there's two dump trucks coming down the same route you can see how close the houses are to the, the edge of the road So this goes on all day long, um, particularly in the morning and the evening. The commute uh, is just a steady, non-stop stream of traffic. And last one, this turn around again, and there's another five-ton truck coming down the, the road. So the school is is very close up there. I think you didn't see it on the, on the map, but it is. It's a school zone. So I just wanted to talk briefly about the advantage of the proposed road. Uh, it would shift all the direct traffic through a direct line from the bridge at East River Road across Glen Morris Road, away from the school zone and the residences along Princess Street. Uh, no new lots in the proposed subdivision would have direct access to the bypass, as access to the bypass is, would be prohibited through the use of one-foot reserves in favor of the county of the Brant. There's a significant growth planned for St. George as endorsed in the official plan, which will uh, most certainly mean that more commuter traffic will be taking that road. Um, so it would seem prudent uh, to address the traffic situation in Glen Morris at this time to alleviate uh, these future increases in volumes. So the land necessary for the construction of the road would be gifted to the County of Brant by Tredonning. The proposed route would save significant fuel, uh, time, and result in less noise in the hamlet. Access points on the current route is 10 driveways uh, on Princess Road, 
Princess Street and one road, Dunbar Road, that comes out on Princess Street. The new route is considerably safer at two access points. So Forbes Street, which is down at the bottom by the library, uh, has an ongoing problem with traffic and parking congestion due to the river access point and is a constant source of frustration for those living there. Access to the river was temporarily closed last year uh, due to the volume of complaints. So the additional lands, Block 25, which we'll go back to in the sketch, uh, of the county's proposed community centre site would be gifted to allow drainage for the subdivision and community centre potentially providing additional parking for river access users, thereby eliminating the Ford Street congestion. Uh, another advantage, access to the proposed community centre would be safer from the new proposed road rather than East River Road, which has a higher speed limit and limited sight lines uh, as that property fronts on to East River Road and it's on a hill. Uh, proceeds from the sale of one of the lots in the subdivision would be donated to Habitat for Humanity to purchase building materials for a local habitat project within the County of Brant. The houses in the subdivision would be required to utilize similar building materials while still allowing for individuality. Um, by doing so, there'd be a uniformity within the subdivision. For example, four different choices of stone colors, four but complementary colors, of roof shingles, that kind of thing. Um, the overall concept would be a subdivision that fits the community without having significant differentiation amongst housing designs, which would prevent a California modern architecture beside a more traditional looking home. These are the uh, an example of a house that, that we'd be looking at to uh, to put there. So it would be a subdivision of those, that style of houses. Um, and the lower one is a, a lot two, that would be a shop uh, that I would consider building. In conclusion, the proposal to add approximately 20 lots would not overwhelm the hamlet and is comparable in size to the development that took place a few years ago on the west side of the hamlet. It's our hope that this overall proposal could be included in the updated official plan, which is currently being completed. Uh, we believe the proposal is a low impact development that's a good match with the existing community and would add to the overall safety for the residents of Glen Morris and those traveling through it. Uh, thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that council may have about the project. Councillor Pierce, you're first. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so when you spoke of the, um, you stated no new lots would have direct access due to the, the, the use of the one foot reserves. That's just a fancy way of saying the driveways are going to be off of street B, correct? There's going to be no driveways. On They're street on B. the proposed road. I'm going to see if I can go back here and uh, yeah, so, so all of the, uh, the lots in the subdivision would front on to that ring street road. B. Yeah, there would okay. be no frontages onto the access. Okay, fine. So, and that, that, that's good. Yeah. Um, when you spoke of the advantages of the, of the proposed road, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not opposed to this. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but when you say the proposed road would save significant fuel, time, and result in less noise, it's. I, I'm, I'm curious as to that statement. As really, you're talking maybe a difference of a thousand feet, maybe not even. Uh, well, I've I've had personal. I've got personal knowledge of that because I traveled that road and did that commute for 29 years, six right. days a week. So um, it does take a lot of time uh, going down in there and you're waiting for traffic to come across on East River Road before you can turn left. And then you're up the hill, which is a lot steeper hill uh, than would the proposed road would be across there. So, I mean, when you're talking a thousand cars a day or 800 cars a day, that, that does add to significant. There's only two stops instead of three. Um, you wouldn't have the noise um, that you would in the in the residential part of the subdivision would be on our road. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one, okay. And one other one I have. Um, in the conclusions, when you speak of the, we believe this proposal is a low impact development. When you say low impact development, do you mean that it's, it's uh, low impact to the surrounding areas, or are we talking low impact as in you're going to use uh, permeable pavement and that sort of low impact development? Um, well, uh, at this point, it was your first uh, thing. It would be low impact, fit into the into the surroundings, but we would certainly look at that uh, 
those considerations as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or clarification? Councillor Kyle? Thanks, Mr. Mayor, through you to the de delegation. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, you spoke about the, the two lots that would be kept for um, a, a residence and the, the shop that you had. had um, is the, can you maybe explain the rationale between keeping them as, as two separate lots? Is, are you thinking of having the shop for some commercial purposes of some kind, or is it strictly uh, just no, it for wouldn't be use? commercial purposes. It would be uh, just a, I restore old cars, and I recently retired, so I'm just looking for somewhere to. Okay. I, I sold my premises in in the uh, Dumfries Industrial Park, so I'm, I'm looking to put another building up there to just okay. do it. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to the delegation. Um, Clarify, um, you said something about were you planning on donating the land for the road or and are you planning on building the road for county standards? Yes. And how long a stretch is that? Uh, would that road be? How long would the stretch be? Yes. Uh, in between the two concessions. So do you have any, uh, an idea on the uh, length of feet? I'm feet, not metric. Sorry. Uh, well, it would be on this. Um, I couldn't give you an actual answer because I can't see the diagram. <laughs> My glasses. Yeah. <laughs> any any other questions of clarification? Seeing none, thank you. Oh, sorry. The question, I, I didn't answer the one about the habitat. Okay. Uh, sorry. So it would be the proceeds from the sale of one of those lots would all go to the habitat. <laughs> So just to be clear, you're not building a house in your survey that is going to be used for habitat, but just the monetary value of the lot would go toward a build somewhere in the county. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Five point six, that is everything we know about the Papal property. Good evening, I guess it's evening now. Um, Mayor Bailey, members of council. Uh, my name is Eric Solaslea. I'm a planner with GSP Group and we're planning consultants for Green Life Proteins Limited uh, for their property in Canesville. And with me I have Sheldon Papel, who's the owner of uh, Green Life Pro Proteins. To give you a little bit of a context, um, the, uh, the property is approximately 33 hectares or 81 acres and uh, Green Life Proteins bought this property from the Ministry of Transportation Ontario and uh, the property has access and frontage on County Road 18 as well as uh, Colburn Street via Papal Road. <coughs> Uh, we made various submissions to council in the past uh, past official plan public meetings and uh, the uh, the council had added uh, the this portion of land that's shown on the screen to the uh, the official plan for employment uses now as I said the uh, the property is proximate to the Highway 403, which has access via the Garden Street intersection through County Road 18. Um, the site is not prime agricultural lands under the uh, OMAFRA, or Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food mapping. <clears throat> um, there, it has uh, overhead uh, hydro lines along a number of frontages, as well as it has a 
a gas main that runs and would be making that uh, ideally to service uh, you know the needs of, of, of the, uh, the proposed employment uses <clears throat> and uh, we'd reviewed the uh, the addendum to the MCR and there's it would meet the needs for strategically located employment lands uh, given its proximity to the highway 403 interchange and uh, our client supports the the final draft uh, just gonna put it in um, so the uh, the the papal lands are or the, the green <laughs> green light protein lands are designated in employment in the final draft of the um, the official plan and uh, the um, there's we note there's a site specific policy restricting that to uh, dry industrial uses until services are provided and uh, our client is in support of that designation and the site specific policy um, for dry industrial uses until such time as services are provided and uh, so in conclusion we we do support the the uh, designation and uh, we're available to respond to any questions that uh, that you may have unless Sheldon wants to make a okay well Sheldon wants to speak <laughs> Mr. Mayor Sheldon. as stated my name is Shelton Popple I'm the owner of Greenlight Proteins Limited I think the counselors and staff have took a big step um, for the growth and development of the Keensville area by giving this dry development uh, designation. Um, it's been pointed out that there was some uh, natural gas line. There's a four inch main gas line going down Pample Road. There's also high voltage wires going down Pample Road adjacent to the property. There's another high voltage uh, line that runs down the unopened road. And for anybody who doesn't know what the unopened road is, that's actually Henry Street over a hundred years ago. Okay, so there was no garden at south. In fact, Grand County Road 18 stopped at Mr. Coleman's place. There was no bridge over the Grand River. So given that, I've also seen the uh, preliminary and vital environmental assessments that shows their services going down Pompa Road. This is probably a great time and opportunity for the county to probably get at the table again with the city because the city has made a commitment to supply um, services to Keynesville for uh, employment lands for the future. So I think it uh, fits well for everybody to have an opportunity to get this started again. And maybe there's some things that maybe uh, most of the counselors know there's a lot of activity on Pample Road right now on a daily basis, and uh, there will become more. And maybe there's something the counselors don't know is that the sewage lagoons that are in Canesville, there was a ministry order given about 2005 or so that those had to go. And so 10 years later was the direct, they're still there. So with the opportunity of having the employment lands from the city of Brantford coming into the Canesville area, there's also an opportunity to start thinking about the pumping station in Canesville. There's all kinds of room on the trunk going to Colburn Street. So you have a commitment with the city to get started on this. So maybe the timing's perfect to move ahead with this. And uh, if there's any other questions and I can answer them. Thank you. Any questions of clarity? Councillor Miller. Just, um, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the delegations. Just looking at the map, it looks very green. Is a big chunk of that uh, natural heritage? Big, big pardon, I don't understand. Is, is a big chunk of that natural heritage, or like how much of that could be developed? Uh, th there is uh, one little, on the 80 acres, we'll say 80 acres, there is one little spot that runs down by the unopened road that is a, a natural easement that can never be touched. But the rest of the land doesn't have any other obstacles on it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 5.7 Auto Hands Fielding. Mr. 
Mr. Maria Bailey, dear counselors and public. I am Otto Feiden, living at 270 East River Road. I am a retired architect and town planner. I was owner and leader of an engineering and an architectural group for most of my lifetime. To the councillors, one sentence before I really start. Uh, you have a package of me before you. That package you can disregard. Uh, the planning office has dealt with me with that, so we need not to talk about that. My speech today is about the official plan, is about environment and the needed protection of farmland. You have an official plan now, which is nearly ready. And I have looked over it. You have a good framework, a good frame. You have good consultants, I think. And you have good planners in-house. I could not conform with everything, but with the main points for sure. You're growing fast, but grow, grow, growth and growing comes always with a price. Fast growing comes with a hefty price. So you have to make sure by all your growing, and I believe from my experience, you may even underestimate your growing. You will grow even faster in the future. You have to make sure that environment, nature, wildlife, and our farmland gets not run over over the time. We are in a time of climate change. What means that? It's a modern word like farm land protection, climate change protection. Let, let me explain my, my thinking about climate change. We are not in the same stage in climate change all over the world. There are, in my opinion, three stages where we're going through. That is climate change. That is environment change. And that is environment collapse. We here in Canada, we are in the first stage, climate change. But there are countries in the world, let me name one or two, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. They are already in environment collapse. And there are other countries, like some of the European countries, they are in the stage of environment change. And I believe we are slipping slowly here in Canada into the second stage now, into environment change. Why do I say that? I have a fruit garden on my farm, 45 fruit trees, Two weeks ago, 
by, on a day with 24 degrees Celsius, no wind, sunshine, pretty nice pollination, weather, 20 some trees blooming. We did a checking of the trees. We found out we had one single honeybee on over 20 trees. One single. When we look a little back, looking in old books, they get mentioned from the first settlers here. Oak, beech, all the trees around. Now, beech, birch, elm are not more existing. We're losing at the moment fodder trees like the white pine and you have to help me uh, ash, ash trees. All three sorts of ash going down. There is no hold. Canada is therefore slipping in stage two environment change. So coming we now to Grant County. A wonderful county. You say that on your logo. Sim simply top. Agriculture is a big and important part of your community. Ancient societies in the world, when we go a long time back, that's not a new thing, not, not somebody of today. They depleted their resources, they disappeared. When we deplete our, our resources here in Canada, we now, some countries are in the third stage. They're going from North, uh, North Africa, from Middle East to Europe, because they cannot live there anymore. To where do we Canadians go? We are probably the last ones, but <coughs> I talked about refugees, looking about the war in the Ukraine. You need only a bunch of a, a bunch of gangsters like that guys in Russia to take the whole world hostage. Why? <laughs> they want the resources there, especially oil, gas, and grain. And we found out now there is no way that we can feed the existing world with the resources when Ukraine not can deliver the grain. Now, let's come to Ontario. We think that's far away. It isn't. We're coming to those points here as well. Let me tell you that. The last census shows that we're losing 116,400 acres on land, on farmland, per year. That are 319 acres a day. 319 acres farmland we're losing alone in Ontario a day. We're losing two to 300 farm operations a year. Did you know that less than 5% of Ontario's land mass, forget the, forget the water, forget the lakes, less than 5% of Ontario's land mass is fit for grain, uh, for grain raising. Now, experts predict 2050, and that is 
less than 30 years in the future, we have 1.5 to 2 million more people on the planet. Can we feed them? No. It's not possible. And think on the cost. You see that when you buy groceries every day. And I predict you here today, those grocery prices, those food prices, they may go back for a half a year or a year. But look 20 years ahead and we're spending not more 15% of our income for groceries and food. We're spending 50%. That's what they have in some other countries there, like Middle East. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, you, you've run out of time. Um, if you could maybe just conclude. Yeah. I like to get, get your attention to our farmers. In your official plan, they need protection. They invest. That is the backbone of our society. When you open a business, you invest 10, 15, maybe $100,000. They invest hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And they need the, the security, the safety, to, that they can farm their farms and their land that they rent in still in, in, in 20 or 30 years. Otherwise, otherwise, you cannot do our investment. I like to conclude, you have to be stiff you to your commitments to your official plan. Make sure that you not change your mind here and there where it is not necessary. Protect our farmland where you have a chance and a choice to protect it. Around your big settlements, there is no other way. But in the country itself, let the country alone. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the delegation? I, clear. Thank you very much for your presentation. It means a lot to us that you care as much as you do. And uh, thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, we're going to move on to 5.8, and that would be Dr. Ella Haley. Thank you, Otto. Thank you for that presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new council. I think, don't think I've ever spoken yet to the new council in person, so I, I've not even been in this chamber since it's, since it's been renovated, quite the renovation. So... Um, I'm listening to all of the presentations and I just wanted to uh, maybe start off with a statement. When I heard Jamie presenting, um, it sounded as if Bill 97 was passed. I hope not. Where's Jamie right now? Where'd he go? I hope not. Yeah, it sounded as if it was passed and it's historic. I belong to the National Farmers Union. I'm on the National Committee for Farmland and I'm on the Provincial Committee and we're very, very concerned. Um, about especially small family farms. But uh, it's very historic. Usually if I'm not making a presentation about farmland, I sometimes will have an OFA person say, well, we're bigger than you. We have a lot more members than you. We're bigger than you. But this is historic. What we have is a statement last week, and it's from all of the farm groups in Ontario, the, all of the registered farm groups, the Christian Farmers Federation, the OFA, the National Farmers Union. And in addition, it's from... It's from, I'm just looking here, the Broiler Hatching and Egg, uh, Egg and Chick Commission, the Beef Farmers, the Ontario Pork Farmers, the Egg Farmers, the Sheep Farmers, Veal Farmers, Chicken Farmers, uh, Ontario Farmland Trust, Turkey Farmers, Dairy Farmers, and the Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Alliance. And they're all very, very concerned about that bill, Jamie. They're very, very concerned. Uh, collectively, they're saying we are seeking, they're writing to Ford, and they're saying, we're seeking your commitment to preserve Ontario's farmland and specialty crop lands across the province. Um, so I think it feeds right into what Otto was saying. And um, I just thought I'd start my presentation with that. Um, as I listen, I just wanted to tell you, we have 
two small farms. We have a 12-acre farm and a 45-acre farm. We're divided by the rail trail, so it's two farms. We farm it as one. But um, I calculated, I think my calculation's out by about eight acres, but I calculated that the total ask tonight is about 460 acres of agricultural land. That's eight of our farms that people are asking for. And I wanted to ask Jennifer and the planners, they may not know, how many acres so far with the official plan have been converted, accepted, recommended from agriculture to um, settlement Settlement, sorry, what's the settlement boundary expansion area? So I, I don't know if you have that at your fingertips, but I suspect it's at least a few thousand. I could be wrong. No, okay, that's good. But um, I would like to know that number. Um, I've gone through each application, and when I look at New Durham, when I look at all of the pictures, you've all seen them, they're all farming that land. That's all good farmland. They're doing well. It looks like soybeans to me or whatever. But uh, I drive by these farms, and it looks like pretty good farmland. Uh, New Durham, 169 acres. That's a lot of farmland. Like, how many of my farms is that? Um, Bishop's Gate, uh, TCA. That's a little. That's that's a little bit bigger than one of my farms. That's a farm. Bishop's Gate, 103 acres. Okay, that's almost twice of our farm. Oak Hill Drive, that's one of my farms. That's, that's called a uh, minor rounding out. That's my farm. My farm is 12 acres, and that's called a minor rounding out. Um, Glen Morris, um, I sort of feel it's very generous of you to straighten out traffic problems, but it's a big ask. I'll give you a road if you give me all this housing on good farmland. It's 37 acres and a half. Um, Green Life Protein is 88 acres and a half. And um, it's good farmland. I live quite close to that farm. Um, we're losing our agricultural land base. Otto has said that we're losing it. Uh, all, all of the farm groups have just spoken up and written to the premier saying something's really, really wrong with this picture and we need to readjust. Um, Brant County is known for its agriculture. It's known for its food. I'm fourth generation farm in this county. I, I love the land and I love our agricultural history. And um, we need to work a, real, a whole lot harder to protect that land. Uh, nobody's talking really uh, in these proposals about the loss of agricultural land. That's the loss of somebody's living on that land. And Otto, I hear you say protect the farmers, but I'm also looking at who's making the proposals. And sometimes the person making the proposal is a farmer. So um, when the green belt was made, my father used to go to the coffee shop and we're just, our farm's just inside the green belt. So when the green belt was made, the farmers would gather at Tim Hortons, and they would talk about who the next millionaire would be. I suspect now it's the next multimillionaire, but they would sit around and figure out who had the most land and who would be the next millionaire. So Otto, you say protect the farmers, but I think we need to protect the farmland. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes seeing that farmers are the proponents of the very development that we're trying to, um, that we have concerns about. So I have two asks in the official plan. Um, it's a big, thick document. I try to get through it during the middle of the night because that's the best time to read. <laughs> um, is please protect agricultural land. No more settlement boundary expansions. That's enough, okay, onto agricultural land. We cannot afford to lose any more farmland. And I've also been a professor, a sociology professor of environment and health. And we worked very hard about eight, nine years ago uh, to stop incineration. And the council supported stop incineration. Incinerators are like big animals, they have to be fed, and you have to keep finding garbage to feed them, and they make toxic ash, and it's in the official plan, it's there. And I asked the planners, and they said what well, was in sort of the, the Ontario draft, but this council, the previous council, took it out, and right now, energy from waste, which is a nice word for incineration, is back in. So I'm just making that request. Um, we could do, it's very expensive, a lot of communities go bankrupt from incinerators, uh, it produces toxic emissions as well. It wastes pre precious resources that can be recycled and reused. Um, I'd love to see better recycling, uh, in, as in other communities. I save my plastic bags to take to Kitchener because Kitchener will, recy will recycle them. I look for friends who have better recycling and I take my stuff there. Um, we have the Langford Schoolhouse. I would love to write a grant and set up a repair station, but I think the repair station should be at the landfill. I think. Uh, 
uh, but other communities do it. And, and I'm just, could we put funds into that instead of energy from waste? Could we recycle styrofoam? I have to take it again to other communities. What about farmers' big plastic greenhouse waste? You know the plastic? It just breaks my heart to see used farmers' plastic and what do we do with it? I look and look for a home. Uh, and then more frequent toxic waste days and not so far away. I'm at the east end. It's pretty far to go to the far west end to take my toxic waste, uh, like paint cans. So, um, uh, yeah, I just want you to keep an eye on Bill 97. Uh, the farm groups throughout Ontario are united, protect farmland, and you have the chance to do that tonight or tomorrow night uh, and to reconsider some of these requests. And thank you for all the work you do. It's a lot of sitting, it's a lot of reading, and um, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Uh, are there any questions of clarification for Ella? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Um, 5.9 Wayne Fife, Curtis Ave, South Neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Wayne Fife, and I live at 42 Curtis Avenue South. Curtis Avenue is a lovely little lane. I don't know who named it an avenue, because it's not very wide, certainly not uh, wide as a city street is. It has no curbs, no sidewalks, uh, no sewage treatment. Everybody's got their own. Uh, and it's about, you know, three, three or four kilometers long, and there's lots of development. And as you turn onto Curtis Avenue south, uh, just before the high-level bridge across from the fire department, uh, you'll find some lovely houses that move along, and then all of a sudden, where the land drops off, it drops off into what used to be a gravel pit, and there's nothing there. And then past the gravel pit, there is a very valuable farm. I'm so delighted to be follow, following the last two speakers because it's part of what I'm going to present today. I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Laura, Laura Schutz, uh, who has been elected by our neighborhood group to represent uh, us uh, before the Ontario Land Tribunal because there is an application uh, by the owners and developers to put in uh, more than 100 houses at the end. Uh, and uh, we clearly are not in agreement with that. And so uh, Laura would be here, but she's an ER doc. And by golly, she's working today, so she asked me if I would present, so that's why I'm here. And the main points I want to make, I'll be mercifully brief because it's been a long afternoon, I know, for everyone, is in the letter that Laura sent uh, to all of you, and you have it in your package, I'm sure. We find it premature that the lands previously deemed excess, so this is about excess lands again, and the last official plans submitted to the province are now being earmarked as neighborhood, especially since the whole concept of what's going to happen to those lands is before the Ontario Land Tribunal, and we are waiting to find out when our next hearing is. Jody might know more than I do, but I think it's in October sometime. And uh, that is not yet uh, resolved. We're trying to find some kind of compromise that makes sense. But sure enough, if the excess lands thing disappears from the official plan, that pulls the rug right out from under us and some of the arguments that we're trying to make. So that's our appeal to you. The other appeal that we're making has to do with farmland. At the end of Curtis Avenue South is Norma and Tom Isotam's farm. Norma uh, made names Cavan, and some of you here will know the Cavan family been farming that farm for five generations or thereabouts. Right, Norma? Norma's sitting over there in the blue t-shirt. Five generation farm. It's a very vi vi valuable and viable farm at the present time. If the excess land designation doesn't happen or some equivalent of that to protect that part of the land between where the houses end in the street and where the farm begins, then there's going to be something happening. there. And if that happens in there, then the farm will become non-viable. Because imagine if 100 houses were in there. How many dogs will there be 
with 100 houses. And how many of those dogs won't be on a leash and will find their way onto the farm and they'll disturb the cattle, they'll disturb the horses, they'll disturb the geese and the chickens and Lord knows what else. So we are all about what it says in your plan in, on page nine, protecting what we value, ensuring that farmers uh, following normal farming practices, which Norma and Tom do, are not hindered by conflicting in new development. So our view basically is that it's premature for council in your official plan to completely get rid of the concept of, of uh, protected lands, uh, designated lands where they can't be developed for a while, at least until the OL, Ontario Land Tribunal, OLT uh, hearings uh, are completed. That's my presentation, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd be happy to answer questions. Are there any questions of clarification for Mr. Fife? Seeing none, thank you. We've heard your concerns. That brings us to the end of our delegations. Now, I know that we have other delegations that uh, have come in today that want to be heard, but I think at this point we need to take a break. Um, I've been told we need to take a break. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to recess for a half an hour and come back. Uh, we stand adjourned.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've now completed all of the delegations that signed up for tonight, and we know that we have a couple of more delegations uh, that want to speak. So I will ask the clerk who the next one is. Uh, yes, Your Worship. The first delegation is Brandon Flewelling for Paris Grand Estates. Okay, well, good evening again. Um, thank you for having me back to, uh, to speak on behalf of another property. Um, so I'm here this time to speak on behalf of Paris Grand Estates. Um, and we have submitted a number of letters and, and worked very closely with staff um, through the OP review process. And I'm um, certainly grateful of all the, the discussions we've had and the, uh, the comments that we've received back. Uh, there's just two minor things or two sort of additional things I would suggest that uh, in our latest submission that um, remain outstanding. Um, so the first one is within the Paris Grand Estate subdivision, there's the former, or the, the, the former River House Inn. Um, the River House Inn is operated as a, an, a hotel, event space, convention center, um, sort of a, a corporate center um, for many, many years on this property. And in the 2012 official plan, it enjoyed a, a, a site-specific policy to really reflect that use. Just to, So it's evidently clear that the River House Inn had these permissions and um, you know, it, the operation was in line with the official plan. In the new official plan, the, the property is to be designated neighborhoods, and there are inclusive policies within the neighborhoods designation that I, I would suggest allow it to continue. Um, but it leaves a little bit of ambiguity. Uh, and our, our first request to council would be to consider maintaining a site-specific designation on this property so that when others are looking at this in the future, um, it, it's very clear that um, uh, the, the draft wording that I have, and this is included in your packet for tomorrow, but that the the River House Inn could operate as a hotel, event space, convention, sorry, convention center, and corporate center, together with the facilities for recreation, social, educational, and or meeting purposes, would be permitted on the lands designated with the special exception. Um, the request in this regard is just to make it evidently clear and to carry forward a site-specific policy that exists in the, the current official plan. Um, so it's not a, not a point of disagreement with staff by any means. The, the new neighborhood designation does allow for it, but it, it's, you know, the, the new designation permits things such as institutional, commercial, office, and communi uh, community uses. We just want to make it clear. Um, the, second, the second comment, and this is, this is more of a, a comment, um, but it's a discussion that we've had with staff going back and forth. And this is really getting into the details of dealing with one specific policy. And it is as it relates to the servicing policy. And this is included, uh, again, in my letter um, at part four, at part four of the new official plan, section 9.13. It notes that development may proceed when all external infrastructure is in place. Um, and, and we're suggesting that wording perhaps should be when servicing is feasible. And the, the nuance there is that um, Development in this specific policy, I think, is really related to when a building permit is issued. So, at the the point of draft plan approvals or when things are coming forward, the develop the the infrastructure might not be in place, but it, it will be feasible and will have to be there, obviously, for the point of a, a building permit to be issued. So, again, it's a it's a real fine nuance, but it's something that um, that we've picked out through through the review of the OP, and I wanted to um, to bring that to your attention. So it's. It's down into the weeds, but the comment is included in your package tomorrow. Um, and with that, I would just answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions for the presenter, Clarity? What's the actual address of the property again? Uh, it's the River House Inn. Um, it's within the Paris Grand, uh, Paris Grand Estate subdivision. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Nothing no further. other questions. Okay. Thank you all. Alicia, who's next? Thank you, Your Worship. Next, we have Dave Aston with Res 982 Rest Acres Road, but I don't know. 
So next, Your Worship, we have Kevin Bouchard uh, with regards to 245 Oakland Road. Uh, good evening, uh, Your Worship and uh, members of council. My name is Kevin Bouchard. I'm a, a senior associate. I'm a planner. Uh, with IPS Innovative Planning Solutions. We're out of Barrie. Um, a long way are to travel, I suppose, but my clients are here and so am I. Um, I've left my address with staff, so uh, if they need to, they know how to get a hold of me. I have two files that I want to speak to this evening. Uh, the first is um, uh, 229, a second concession road uh, for Penmar Holdings, Inc. And um, I, I think I owe council members an apology. I sent you out an email on Friday night because I missed the deadline. So, uh, but I wanted to get the information out to you. Uh, I did bring paper copies if it's uh, required or if uh, there's an interest to do that. I left them with the clerk. So, uh, but it's a very short letter and really what I'm interested in speaking to you about is the figures attached to the letter. So I promise it won't be that complex or painful going forward. So we represent uh, Penmar Holdings Inc. And, the land use plan and their land use planning matters related to 229 uh, Concession Road here in the county. And the lands themselves are a little over 50 hectares in area, 51.1 areas in hectare in area, and they have frontage on both Second Concession Road and at Middletown Lot. Uh, our client has uh, initiated applications with the county uh, for official plan amendment, uh, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision approval on the property for a 32 lot uh, employment uh, development. And uh, the subdivision plan uh, you know, provides for, and this is where the, the sketch comes in handy, a single, a single right of way uh, arcing from Middletown Road and then up to uh, second uh, uh, concession line. The uh, lotting plan, as I mentioned, uh, no, I didn't mention this. I'm sorry. The lotting plan requires, in a, because the lands are, are split designated, employment and agricultural in the current official plan, 2012 official plan, the lotting plan requires an employment land use conversion over approximately the north half of the property. And it's critical to our client to achieve this conversion uh, because in bringing forward the application for a draft plan of subdivision, designing the subdivision, uh, developing it, it's much more efficient uh, for him to go forward with the complete lot development. I have no history on why the lands were split designated historically. Our client is confident that uh, he can bring forward these lands in the marketplace and they'll be well received. So the draft plan, official plan designation for the, uh, uh, in the new official plan mirrors the enforced official plan and split designates the property general employment and agricultural land use, and that's on figure three of our, our, our uh, submission. Our specific request to this council is simply that the general employment land use designation uh, be applied to the whole of the Penmar Holdings Inc. property so that he can, you know, efficiently to bring these lands forward to develop. As I've said, we've initiated applications, we've completed uh, a pre-consultation meeting, and, uh, are, and are engaging consultants to go forward with uh, immediate development of this property. Uh, I'm, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Any questions of clarification? Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Murthy. Can you just clarify, you, you, you said it was a 32 parcel? How yeah, it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's one parcel, of course, now, but it's a 32 uh, lot uh, development. 32 lot. And uh, it's attached uh, uh, as a sketch to the uh, submission that I, I sent out. Thank you. Any other? Councillor Miller. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Just to clarify, um, through you, the center. Is that, is that the property that they're using now for, for storage of materials? My, my, I don't, my understanding that it's just, it's vacant. There's no use in the property currently. If there's something different going on, I perhaps should check my facts. Okay, I, I think there is. Just to clarify, I think uh, David is thinking of the seed cleaning plant. This is the Park Hill farm beside that. 
115 acres, and it was just planted with soybeans yesterday, and I planted it, so I, I know the property. So, so the employment designation extends from south of 403 right up to uh, the second uh, concession like you, you, uh, uh, in the sketches that I've shown. So this, to us, is a logical sequential development of a property provides for that. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. And thank you for your assistance, Councillor. <laughs> if I can go then to my second uh, deputation. Um, Please. Uh, so this is a, a deputation uh, dealing with uh, 245, the property at 245 Oakland Road. It's within the Scotland settlement area, uh, of course, in the county of Grant. And I want to be very clear, we are not requesting a settlement area expansion uh, with this development. Uh, what is happening, though, however, is that we have uh, submitted an application to the municipality uh, for plan of subdivision and rezoning of the property to provide for the development of uh, 37 uh, uh, single-family lots and uh, stormwater management and uh, natural environment areas as appropriate. So it's a, a, a rural residential subdivision development proposal that is consistent with the uh, 2012 uh, 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 official plan. So what's our issue? The issue is that the application has been deemed incomplete at this time. And according to the transitional uh, uh, policies in the official plan, the Hello? new official plan. I have to stop you, the clerk said. Uh, sorry, Your Worship, through to um, the speaker. We're here to speak about official plan applications and not current applications, which might be before the planning and development team. So if you could just keep your comments with respect to the official plan-related requests, that would be appreciated. Okay. Uh, certainly I can do that. I'll try and uh, be clear on that. So what are the issues that we're facing? And, and uh, you know, this is an application that it deemed complete, I'm looking over to the clerk to make sure I don't go off the track, uh, would be, would be, would, would fall out of issue with the new official plan because we would go forward with the transitional policies that are in the official plan. So that would satisfy the issues. However, if not, then the application begins to go backwards. Uh, additional area studies, block studies, et cetera, are going to be required to facilitate the development of this property at a time when we've already committed and submitted all of the requisite studies to the municipality. So it's an issue that I want to draw to Council's attention because it speaks to the importance of managing this transitional process in the official plan. And I want to say that staff are working with us to work through this issue. And it is a work in progress, so it's not a negative in that context. But it is something that council should be aware of, that transitional policies are really critical and uh, can uh, and are necessary in, in terms of their application in, uh, in proposals such as this. Now, I have to... I feel uncomfortable hearing this right at, the, at this moment when we understand it's going to a hearing somewhere along the line. I, sorry. I think we'll, we'll conclude your presentation. All right. So I'm only going to say that uh, we're working with staff to resolve this issue, Mr. Mayor, or uh, your worship, and uh, we hope that we can bring this to a resolution as soon as practically possible. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions to the presenter? Seeing none, thank you very much. Madam Clerk, who's next? So next, we have a Sheila Ann Rosalind, who is speaking with regards to farmland development. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Can we just get an idea of, of how many how many we have? Like, are there 10 more, are there five more? There's Sheila Ann more. would be the last one on oh. our list. We did have an additional one who has withdrawn. Okay. So assuming the mayor will call to see if there's any more from the floor, but assuming um, there are none, then this would be our last delegation. Thank you, just bear with me. Good evening, Your Honor and Council. Um, sorry, I'm really nervous. 
I've never done this before, so um, I just um, have a letter from all our neighbors. It's in regards to agenda item 5.6, um, the Eric Sosslisha GSP group on behalf of the Green Life Proteins, Papal Road. If I could read this, I also have a letter that I wrote myself, if I could do that afterwards. Um, we do not support the request to add 33 hectares, 81.55 acres of agricultural land to the urban settlement of Canesville. This is an excellent farm and we cannot lose any more agricultural land to the development. Grant County Council and planning staff have agreed in the past to preserve and protect agricultural lands, curb urban sprawl and land consumption. We understand that the draft new official plan is trying to protect agricultural land and that amending settlement area boundaries and land designations outside these established areas to create further development will not be supported. Please do the right thing. Protect this farmland from development. Can I get these two up here? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Thank you. Are there any questions to the delegation? Yeah, one more. I I just have my letter. Yep. Okay. Um. Again, it's to item five point six. Um. Let me say, my name is Sheila Roseland. My family and I have been community members for twenty years, and have enjoyed raising our four children here in this home on Johnson Road. We we chose to live in the country when we moved to this area for a reason to embrace this life with such a wonderful farmland surrounding us. Should you take this farmland away from us, abutting our backyard, it will greatly affect our family, our neighbors, and our life experiences. It will as well disrupt the wildlife that inhabits the wetland area that, and all the families that live here to enjoy. To note, when the city side of Garden Ave South started to develop, the amount of animals killed by road accidents increased substantially. We don't want this to happen to ours. We, as well as our neighbors, do not support the negative impact that such an endeavor will cause. We are in an environmental crisis. We need to lower our emissions to the environment, and such a development will not help. It is our responsibility to maintain and work towards protecting our vulnerable ecosystem in our, in, our, in our fight against climate change. This land in question directly contacts a fair amount of the wetlands. This is a definite compromise of this land in a negative way. The wetlands need to be protected. This kind of development is not in the best interest of our environment. Please note that the Canadian Environmental Protection Act of 1999 is focused on pollution and protecting the environment, human life, health risks associated with toxic substances, which factories and industrial contribute to the air pollution. There's health risks to neighboring homes, which does accommodate many children. This is an inherent health risk due to the direct increased pollution emissions. We are in a climate crisis and need to do better. We need to do our best to diminish and actively work against contributing to environmental destruction by, allowing, by not allowing construction of more industrial growth, which will diminish our fam farmlands. This proposal is actually working against Canada's climate plans. We need to reduce our emissions within the next seven years by at least 45% based on Canadian climate plans. How does this comply with the reduction of plans? Please, we need to protect our fam farmlands. In conclusion, you are the electoral officials. You are here in this position because we, the constituents, have put you there to be our voice, to represent us. To do that, you need not to just listen. You need to hear what we are saying. We want the farmland to remain as is. We are asking for this land to not be destroyed but for the lives of the family and the children around to be respected, for this environment and for this environment to remain safe. Should a vote in favor of this development or the destruction 
you have not listened. You have not heard our voices. It would not be possible in good faith to support you any further. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for listening. And to those of you that heard, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions to or clarification to the presenter? See so, you none. Thank you. Thank you for hanging around and, <laughs> thank you. and, and speaking to us. Okay, we have no one else listed to speak. I am going to ask if there's any other delegations that wish to address the Council of the County of Brant for the official plan. We have one. No, you can't. You can't ask any questions during the meeting, but you can. You can hang around until after the meeting and ask. Yeah. Seeing none, I'll ask for the second time if there's any other. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Kyle. Do you want to be a Mr. delegation? Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> um, but I'm fairly certain that Lauren Miller online would like to speak to one of the um, delegations from earlier today. Oh. Okay. Lauren, do you want to give us your address, please? Uh, yeah, it's 418 Glen Morris Road East, St. George. Thank you. I knew that. Go ahead. Okay, so this was on um, the, the Glen Morris Settlement Proposed Boundary Expansion Item 5.5 .5 on the agenda. Yep. Uh, so we, as a community, <laughs> feel that there are some positives and negatives due to this uh, boundary expansion. The proposed boundary expansion, I should correct myself. Uh, a new truck route removing the high volume traffic on Princess Street, which we would all agree that would be uh, something that's definitely need that we wanted to happen for many years, but has been turned down by council three times in the past. Uh, we're not against the new development for the community, but we don't support it in its current plan. We want to see the community represented in this plan and potential environmental and agricultural effects. And we found some uh, some concerns of using the prime agricultural land to develop housing. A 20 lot subdivision seems excessive and more than the existing community can handle. There is no infrastructure in the town of Glen Morris. Each property owner would be looking at putting in their own well and septic system. Why was the land offered to the county by Morton's in the past years to build an arterial road uh, turned down? The new proposed plan is only moving the traffic problem off of Princess Street to the new development. The truck and farm equipment traffic would then be moving through a housing development as it does now and therefore it's not fixing the problem. The current storm drain would have to be changed or moved in order to handle the water runoff from more hard surface areas. And lots one and two are excessive inside and don't fit in with the surrounding homes. A restriction on building sizes needs to be addressed. The safety of the children in the proposed subdivision going back and forth to school and playing outdoors would be compromised due to the new arterial road. Would Glenmore School be able to accommodate the increase in students or would a new school have to be added? We know that the school boundaries were actually just changed recently and they were adding uh, students from uh, Paris into the Glenmore School now. So what would happen with those? Um, yeah, well, as a community, we just feel that this is all very sudden. Um, the land was sold in the spring and this proposal is coming on very fast. Um, we just would like a little bit more communication beforehand, and we don't accept it as it stands. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to the presenter, Councillor Howes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple questions to Lauren. Um, I, I was I just wanted to get some clarity at the beginning of your presentation. You you were speaking about representing the community, and I just I wanted to get a bit of, a bit of a more clear understanding of what that means um, in terms of how many people you're representing. And then, and then I wanted to make sure I understood your message completely. I, amongst the other details you noted, <clears throat> I think you were saying that the houses were too big and there's too many of them. Yes. Is, is, is yes. that the, so, so Smaller in my opinion, yes. Small, a smaller lot sizes, a smaller number of houses, and the houses not as grand, perhaps, is a way of saying it. 
in the proposal that I, through mayor uh, through the proposal we saw the sizes of the houses that were going to be built one being a shop and we just felt that it was going to be massive compared to the other houses that that were in the proposal as well um, I in speaking of the in representation of the Glenmorris community I should have cleared my clarified myself there was a number of us sitting at the back of the room earlier today in the meeting and that's who I was going to be speaking on behalf of not necessarily the entire community Thank you. Are there any other questions to the presenter? Seeing none, I would, I'd just like to tell you that we, we just saw this proposal too, um, and I don't believe it's a fixed site plan. I believe this is just the, a man's uh, uh, rendering of, of what could happen. I don't believe that uh, it, it's, uh, it's cut into stone. I, I, I believe it's just his first attempt at something. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say about that, I think. No other questions? No. Thank you, Lauren. Good night. Thank you. Any other presenters? No one out there? No one in the room? So I'll ask if there's any other delegations that wish to address the Council uh, of the County of Brant for the official plan. Seeing none. I will ask for the second time if there's anyone that wants to speak to the County of Brant Council on the official plan. Seeing none, we'll ask the third time if there's anyone in the room or out there that wants to speak to the Brant County Council on the official plan. Seeing none, I will close the public meeting and I hereby declare the public meeting held under sections 17 and 26 of the Planning Act for the County of Brant official plan be closed. And now I'm going to ask for a motion to receive all of the delegations. Councillor Pierce and Councillor Coleman, all those in favor of receiving? Unanimous, thank you. Uh, we have number seven on the agenda with correspondence. Can I get a motion to receive the correspondence? Councillor Oakley, Councillor McAlpine, all those in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. Mr. Mayor, can yes, sir. Mr. Miller, I had a question uh, regarding the correspondence. Okay, um, the delegations, the ones that are asking for a decision, we are to discuss those tomorrow night. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Uh, what about the correspondence? What about it? Well, some of them are requesting uh, changes to the uh, OP. When Alicia, when did you want to discuss that tonight or tomorrow night? Alicia's going to talk. So the three you worship to Councillor Miller, um, that correspondence has also been referred to Council, so that would be for tomorrow evening. Okay. If any, um, if any councillors want to bring forward any motions with regards to delegations, correspondence received tonight, or part of the uh, <coughs> communications issued in the addendum earlier on today. Okay, we'll do that tomorrow night. Thank you. Any other questions about correspondence? Call that motion again. All those in favor? Opposed? So at this point, I'm going to recess the meeting uh, till tomorrow at 6 o'clock uh, at Council Chambers. I'm um, looking for a motion to adjourn. Oh, well, wait a minute. Now I can't, I can't make a motion. Just call a recess. Just call a recess. There you go. We're done.